So this session is on combustion theory and the lecturer, Professor Matalong. Uh, I always like to make some additional comments that, uh, you know, when you do science study, the combustion, whatever, science is always three pillars. Always. Experiment, theory before, then of course now also computation. Three things, right? So now in combustion, then of course, if you think of the theory, the group of really top people getting less and less. And that's something I really worry. You know, theory is so important, all right? So, uh, but in, in com combustion, you talk about theory, certainly Professor Matalong is, you know, without any uh, debate, it's among the top. That, huh? Oh, you put the slides, okay. I <laughs> see what, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you see? Great, great minds think alike, great minds. So uh, let, let, let me stand here. I, uh, that, uh, now, what should I say? You think of combustion, and then uh, when I think of combustion theory, uh, again, for your own thinking, that you're thinking of all the great people. You start with Landau, Zeldovich, right? All those names familiar to you guys? Landau's. You know, the Russian schools, they're so good. And then later, then, you know, this, uh, in here, then the development of combustion theory, then I think it, around the 50s, 60s, there's not as uh, robust. But when it came to the 70s, again, it came up. 70s was a golden era right, in combustion. 70s and 80s and all that. And I, was, I graduated in 1973, a long time ago. I was lucky. It was really a very robust era in terms of theories. And uh, then with uh, Buckmaster and then uh, Peters and, uh, of course, before that time, Professor Williams, former, he was my supervisor, you know, former Williams, UC San Diego, uh, with this. And uh, so Professor Matalon came on scene in 1977, graduating from Cornell. We are almost the same, I graduated in 73. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, he's been making spectacular contributions uh, in this, and uh, you know, especially in, in the flame theories, the dynamics of flames, stability of flames. I mean, it, it's him, okay, <laughs> with the thing. And then since then, he's, you know, bunch of all, all aspects. Again, as I said yesterday, I mean, he's my hero in, in, in theory. I dabble in theories, and uh, so he, to me, I, he's the one I'll check whether what I've done is right or wrong. So, so I think we are really fortunate to to have him to to you know to to talk uh, to us about combustion theory. Uh, he has, uh, the, in terms of honor, the honors, and he is the chair professor, caterpillar chair professor at uh, uh, UI Urbana Champaign, and he gets all sorts of honor. He's a fellow of uh, many affiliations, certainly Combustion Institute, AIAA, uh, Applied Physics. Uh, no, American Physics Society, APS, and uh, the significant uh, awards of in combustion theory, he got the Zeldovich gold medal. That is, you know, the top. And also the AIAA got the Fluid Dynamics Award, Pendry Aerospace Literature Award, all those are very prestigious ones. Huh? So he's the editor-in-chief of combustion theory and, and modeling. So. Um, and associate editor of JFM, you know, well, those are those are very uh, prestigious uh, appointments. So anyway, uh, I don't think I, you know, that he, he doesn't want me to say too too much, taking away his time. So I leave it to him, and then you guys would have fun, right? That uh, with the, the next the next five days, and uh, uh, eventually all this will come into a book. <laughs> I've been encouraging him to, to, <laughs> to have a book, and then you guys will study it. So let's let's welcome Professor Martin. Thank you very much to Professor uh, Law to, for the nice introduction. I want to start right away. I, I put this uh, slide in order to. Uh, make some general comment and indicate uh, how important uh, is the theory in trying to explain experiment, 
trying to help or understand simulation and of course in understanding and predicting combustion in general. And um, uh, it uh, needs, uh, combustion in general will need multidisciplinary uh, 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 aspect uh, including mechanical aerospace, chemical engineers, applied mathematician, numerical and computational science, uh, chemist, physics, and so on, instrumentation engineers. And uh, the entire week that I will talk about is primarily about theory. And I want to uh, explain what do I mean by theory. So uh, as you will see, we will start, uh, in fact, uh, the first two lectures describing in quite detail what are the mathematical equation or the conservation laws that describe combustion processes. And they are basically based on uh, the uh, law of conservation of mass, momentum, and energy, but they are supplemented by uh, many uh, um, uh, other expression uh, that require understanding transport, thermodynamics, and chemical kinetics. And so we are going to see how the derivation of these equations, I don't mean deriving them uh, all the detailed mathematical step, but the general idea. And, and the purpose for this is to show you that there are many uh, uh, assumptions made. And when you see in some papers uh, uh, a certain set of equations, those are not the most uh, complete or most fundamental one. They have been already simplified usually greatly. So it's important to understand uh, uh, the, those details. Uh, the equation uh, for the most part are known, but they are very difficult to address because they are in general nonlinear and uh, highly coupled and uh, highly also uh, uh, difficult to solve numerically. And uh, uh, in theory, the idea is to try to simplify the equation and to use some models uh, to describe the phenomena that you are interested. So you try not to keep all the uh, elements that are involved in those equation, but to reduce them with the most important one. Uh, and uh, in the course of the lectures that I will be uh, giving you this week, uh, I will show you how they are simplified in a systematic way. In other words, I'm not going to dump on you formulas or dump on you expressions and say, oh, this described that. But I want to show you the idea how these equations were derived from the fundamental equations. And uh, um, this is typically done using, uh, oops, well, I moved. Sorry, just a minute. I'll have to learn how to use this thing, so it would take me a while. <laughs> so uh, this is done using uh, typically uh, uh, more um, uh, appropriate approximations, such as asymptotic method, perturbation method, which, uh, d which uh, help you to choose in a systematic way what are the important factors and what are the less important factors. Uh, and the models that we will be deriving uh, can usually either be solved analytically or numerically in a, uh, they are less intensive than the full equation. Uh, now, you see, in fluid mechanics in general, when after you derive the equation, you know, they usually teach you here are some of the uh, simple exact solution of the equation, such as Poiseuille flow, Kuwait flow. But exact in fluid mechanics means also if you can reduce the problem to uh, ODEs or to a simple PDEs, like, for example, the boundary layer in Blasius uh, uh, equation. In combustion, there is no exact solution, period. There is no problem that, simple problem of combustion that have an exact solution. So from start, you have to use a model or some simplification. And um, so here are some of the important thing of using models. They can easily or more easily solved. I shouldn't use the word easily, but more easily solved. They permit usually full parametric dependence. In other words, they depend on some parameters that you don't solve the problem only for a given specific condition, 
specific temperature, specific equivalence ratio, and so on. But you allow the parameter to vary from very small to very large, sometimes even to an extreme, because sometimes we learn something from the extreme that we didn't anticipate before just by uh, picking only the one that you have seen in experiment. And um, this is also an important aspect of theory. Uh, it clearly identifies what are the important mechanism, the cause and effect. Uh, and of course, as I said earlier, uh, it explains, guide, and complement experimental study and also guide and help uh, numerical simulation. For example, can be used for validation uh, in a certain limit if your, uh, 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 if your code uh, uh, can describe this limit correctly, then you have some confidence that uh, it may be uh, proper to solve it for a more general condition. Uh, so the first lecture I will start is gonna be with conservation equation. And I, I, some of the slides are a little too fundamental. Many of them you may have seen before. I may go through them a little faster than others. Uh, I wanna make few comments. Uh, first of all, there are um, few, very few, but there are some errors in the notes. If I remember, I will mention what they are. Uh, but I suggest that if you want to use anything from the notes, uh, try to use the reference paper which is uh, marked there uh, to verify that it was not typed incorrectly. Second comment is that I made some addition to the lecture notes which are not in the lecture uh, slides which are not in your notes. So uh, I don't know if I'll be able to cover everything that I have in my slides, but we will try. And um, uh, that's basically what I you know, have in mind. If you have any question, uh, feel free to ask. You can ask uh, during the lecture, afterwards, uh, during the break, as you please. So um, the, before we start with the equation for the described combustion, I wanna start basically for the notation, and I will try to keep the uh, entire lecture with the same notation, not to confuse you. There will be occasionally some minor changes maybe in the, in the notation, but otherwise it's very consistent. Uh, so I will start with the conservation of equation of a uh, pure substance, in other words, not chemically reacting, uh, and a single uh, substance. And, um, uh, in fluid mechanics, there are two common ways to describe the fluid motion. You must have already seen this. It's the Lagrangian method and the Eulerian method. Uh, can I ask a question? Are the slides stretched or they seem okay? The wording seems okay because from my end, they look a little fuzzy. So, okay, thank you. So uh, we have the Lagrangian method where we follow individual fluid particle, and we have the Eulerian method which uh, fix a point in space and ask what is the velocity, temperature, density at that point. And uh, of course there is a uh, relation uh, between the two, uh, and that leads to the uh, uh, convection or convective or material derivative, uh, which describe the uh, time rate of change of a property phi as you follow the particle. And this is equal to uh, the partial derivative of phi with respect to time plus the uh, V gradient phi. And uh, you can see the derivation here, but I'm sure you have seen that already, so I will move on. So the general equation conservation law are uh, usually easily written for a uh, material volume, namely a fixed uh, volume, and not one which is uh, uh, changing uh, in time. In other words, you have a fixed volume, and when that volume moves, you follow the same particles. In that case, you can easily write the conservation of mass as the time rate of change of the density integrated over the volume, and uh, since mass is neither created nor destroyed, that's equal to zero. Uh, similarly, you can write the conservation of momentum, which is the time rate of change of the momentum inside the volume, 
uh, of, the, uh, of the entire volume, integrated over the volume, and the change in momentum is equal to the body force acting on the, uh, on the mass of fluid. Uh, F here is the force uh, per, unit, uh, uh, per unit time, uh, and, uh, which is like the acceleration, if you like, uh, and uh, an acceleration, I should say. And, uh, and the surface forces due to traction, and the surface forces are expressed in terms of uh, the stress tensor sigma, which is uh, essentially a matrix that in principle have uh, nine uh, different components, but effectively it's only really six because uh, the stress tensor is symmetric due to conservation of angular momentum. So the stress tensor, the component are sigma ij, uh, and sigma ij is equal to sigma ji. So this is the conservation of momentum, and now conservation of energy uh, is written as the total energy, and the total energy is E total, which consists of the internal energy E and the kinetic energy, uh, one half V square. V square is essentially the dot product of the vector V with itself. And uh, the time rate of change of the total energy is the rate of work done by external forces, external forces consisting both the body force and the surface forces. So uh, here are the two contributions. The body force is integrated over the whole volume, the surface forces, of course, uh, over the surface of that volume. And uh, the uh, heat transfer, where Q is the heat flux vector, which is chosen uh, conveniently as uh, positive for outward transfer, negative for inward transfer. So the last term is the rate of energy flux across the surface of the volume. And uh, you can uh, just express what did I do here, yeah? Uh, so in the next step, what I did, I used the, uh, essentially the divergence theorem to write this surface term as the divergence of sigma v so that it's a volume integral. Uh, this one should await until we define what Q is. So those are the three conservation law written quite easily for a material, um, a material uh, volume. The question is, how do you now express the time rate of change of some quantity phi, for example, for a fixed volume? In other words, we don't follow the same particle, but we fix attention, like the Eulerian view, uh, we fix attention in space, and we ask how does the, uh, these conservation law are written. So the point here is that the time rate of change of the integral of this volume, which is changing in time, is not equal to the integral of the time rate of change of the quantity over the volume. And so what relation should we use here? And so basically we use a generalization of Leibniz rule. Leibniz rule in calculus tell you that in, you integrate a function d by dt from uh, the, when the limit a and b are changing in time, then in addition to the integral of the time rate of change of that quantity, you have uh, boundary effects. Uh, in other words, how does the two point A and B, which are the boundary of the interval, change in time. The equivalent thing here will be the flux over the surface. And so that lead to what is known uh, in fluid mechanics as the Reynolds transport theorem. In other words, uh, what you have to account is uh, during a time interval delta T, uh, what is the flux of the quantity phi, whatever it is, density, uh, momentum, energy, uh, through the surface. So when you do this, and I'm not uh, showing you, of course, the derivation of this, but it's really straightforward, uh, then you obtain that straightforward it doesn't mean that you know how to do it uh, in a second, but it can be done very uh, without too many difficulties. And so basically what you do is just you use the derivation or the definition of a derivative. That's what you do. You take a, 
the distance, the difference between the quantity at a given time t uh, to the other time t plus delta t, you divide by delta t, but the details are a little more involved. So anyway, what you get is the uh, Reynolds transport theorem, which can be written in this way. So this is essentially the flux term that I was describing here, which again, using divergence theorem, you can write it as the divergence of phi v. So remember this relation because I'm going to use it in a multiple times. Uh, in this uh, uh, write-up, um, what we have used is the fact that uh, the, uh, what is moving is the, the fluid velocity, V. And so this is the fluid velocity in this case. But in principle, it shouldn't be the fluid velocity. In fact, this relation is a kinematic relation, and it can be written for any velocity that the control volume moving at. And then it's not usually referred to as Reynolds transport theorem, but effectively it's the same. I mention this because I may use this expression uh, later on if I get to it in deriving uh, the conservation law across an interface, and we will need that because the interface may move at any velocity and not necessarily the gas velocity. And so, now we want to use the, uh, the Reynolds transport theorem to uh, derive conservation, mass, momentum, and energy. We start with mass, so the property phi is the density rho, and uh, here is the application of the Reynolds transport theorem, and what you get is that the integral over the volume V uh, is equal to zero. So the integrand, since the volume V is arbitrary, the only way that that would be equal to zero if the integrand is identically zero, which lead to what is known as the continuity equation or uh, essentially conservation of mass. Note that uh, just as a uh, side comment, if uh, that uh, this expression can be also written as, maybe it's written here, yeah, sorry, this went before that. So it's equivalently can be written as the material derivative of d rho dt plus rho divergence v equal to zero, simply by using the product rule uh, for the divergence of a product of a scalar times a vector. So the two forms are equivalent. Uh, d rho dt uh, divided by rho essentially is the uh, time rate of change of the density of a fluid particle. And if this is small, namely uh, uh, almost negligible, then the divergence V is equal to zero, and we talk about the flow being incompressible. But of course, in all the application that we will be interested, it's not exactly so, so we will comment on that uh, later. Uh, another thing to maybe note is that uh, the reciprocal of rho, I called it V here in the absence of another and uh, in, in another uh, variable, but it's only going to use um, probably here. Uh, it's essentially the specific volume. So what that what it tells you is that w uh, the equation tells you essentially that uh, 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 divergence v is equal to uh, the rate of compression or dilation of uh, of uh, a fluid particle. Okay. So this is conservation of mass. Uh, we apply again Reynolds transport theorem to the momentum rho v and. Uh, uh, the, uh, this was the body force integrated over V. This was the surface forces integrated over the surface. So those remain as before. This one can be uh, using the divergence theorem written as the divergence of sigma. And so the only thing that uh, we apply the Reynolds transport theorem is on the left-hand side of the equation, which gives you this first two terms. Again, what I uh, am showing here that uh, you have an integral over the volume of a quantity which, uh, uh, of a, uh, in other words, one integral over the entire volume. That's the whole idea in those derivations. So you can argue again that for arbitrary volume V, the integrand is equal to zero, and that's exactly the conservation of uh, momentum. The way it's written here, it's written in a conservative form. As you see, we call it conservative form because the density is included here in the convective term. In other words, we're looking for the uh, total momentum. But uh, you can, uh, using the continuity equation, simplify those two terms 
and uh, by essentially multiplying the continuity equation by the velocity and subtracting it from this equation, you get the more familiar form of the momentum equation, which is mass times acceleration, dv by dt is the time rate of change of a fluid particle, of the velocity of a fluid particle, which is acceleration. So it's the acceleration is equal to the forces acting on the particle, which is uh, the volume, the volumetric force, uh, rho f plus divergence sigma. F is uh, very often gravity, but does it have to be gravity? In fact, I will, uh, uh, hopefully I will show you that example, which is not in your notes, that uh, sometimes electrical forces on uh, a product of combustion like ions and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, charged particle could have an effect on the equations, and you will see that hopefully later. So, this is conservation of uh, momentum, and now we move to conservation of energy. Uh, again, we use the Reynolds transport theorem on the term on the left, so it provides those two uh, terms here, and uh, so written under the uh, integral uh, over the volume. And then uh, all the remaining terms are more or less as before, uh, I, I think I used already divergence theorem to write this one as divergence sigma v, and I didn't use that, but that I can again use the divergence theorem to write it as divergence of the heat flux vector. So again, we have a, uh, an integral over the volume of a certain quantity, which uh, will be identically equal to zero, and that's the conservation of total energy over the... Uh, volume in a conservative form. Again, we can use the continuity equation to simplify uh, those two terms, or I don't know if the use who simplify is correct, to rewrite, I should say, the first two terms. And uh, this gives you uh, the equation that you have here. So uh, density time time rate of change of the total energy, which consists again of internal and kinetic energy, is the rate of work done on the fluid by body and surface forces, the first is body and surface forces, and the rate of heat transfer to the fluid, which as we said before, positive for outward propagation. Uh, the next step is we rarely want to write the equation in terms of the total energy, so what we want to do is to uh, uh, remove the kinetic energy part from it and write an equation just for the internal energy. And this is uh, simply done by uh, uh, writing an equation for the kinetic energy. This is directly obtained from taking the momentum equation, multiplying it by V. So you can see immediately that the first term will give you rho d by dt of one half V squared, right? When you differentiate, you get uh, two V, cancel the half V, and so on. So this is how this uh, is obtained. When you extract it from the total energy, this is what you get, rho dE by dt. Uh, there are two contributions here that comes from this term. And uh, what you see is that the uh, term with the uh, uh, body force drop. Uh, and um, minus the divergence of Q, which, uh, which remain. Now, uh, the combination here, it's, it looks complicated in terms of vector notation, but uh, essentially, if you look at it in terms of the components, it's a scalar, and it should be a scalar because what you have here is the time rate of change of a scalar, so the, every term in that expression should be a scalar. Of course, the divergence of a vector is a scalar. And so uh, this quantity is essentially what we, what we say, it's, this operation is referred to as the contraction of two tensors, if you like, two matrices. And so uh, it's essentially uh, the summation, the double summation over i and j. What I have used here is what is known the, uh, uh, the index summation. In other words, when an index appeared twice in that expression, you have to sum over it. So I appear twice, so you sum over I, J appear twice, you sum over J. Anyway, it's a quantity that you can always find in the back of uh, any book in fluid mechanics. Uh, and um, we will uh, 
get back to it uh, soon. So um, the conservation equation now uh, have quantities that uh, are not uh, from the basic variable and we need constitutive relation. Constitutive relation means those are not conservation law, those are relations that are basically obtained by experience, by experiment, by experience, not, uh, uh, not uh, derived law. And uh, the first one for the uh, momentum equation, and that part of it, and also we need also to supplement the equation with some thermodynamic relation because we have an internal energy and so on. So, um, so the, uh, the, uh, the first one is to talk about the stress tensor sigma. And uh, we are assuming that the fluid is Newtonian. Not every fluid is Newtonian. Uh, ketchup, for example, is not a Newtonian fluid. And so it doesn't satisfy exactly this relation. So the relation essentially is that the rate of, of st uh, the stress, the rate of stress, uh, is proportional linearly to the rate of strain. And the strain is related to the velocity field. In other words, how does the velocity field strain uh, the fluid particle? Uh, and um, and uh, this is uh, uh, the relation which is usually expressed in terms of uh, two parameters. One of them is referred to as the shear viscosity. The other one as the second viscosity coefficient. But that other one is usually uh, written as the bulk viscosity minus two-third mu. And uh, kappa here is the bulk viscosity. Uh, minus p, i, i is a unit tensor. Uh, so usually what you see this relation, p is related to the pressure. But strictly speaking, is not quite so. Uh, because it should be just the trace of the, uh, of the stress tensor. Uh, and that trace of the stress tensor is typically related to uh, pressure or equal to the pressure uh, only if you assume the, the Stokes hypothesis, namely that kappa, the bulk viscosity, is zero. There are very few problems or very few situations where that's not the case. And of course, in most of the combustion studies, uh, we are going to assume that the bulk viscosity is zero and move from there. I left it in some of these expressions today, but uh, eventually we will be uh, uh, removing them. So uh, sigma is written as minus p, which is the pressure, a uh, unit vector, a uh, unit tensor I, plus capital sigma. Capital sigma is the, uh, the viscous uh, uh, stress. Uh, so the viscous stress now are known because they're in terms, not, not known, but in terms of the basic variable, which is velocity. Uh, and uh, then the equation, the momentum equation can be written in this form, gradient of the pressure, divergence of the uh, viscous um, stresses and uh, the body force. Okay, the next equation to try to simplify is the uh, energy equation. So the first thing is remember that the energy equation, we also had that sigma. So when we substitute it in, in this, uh, uh, in, in, in this uh, term that I referred to before, which lead to a scalar, right? So when we, the contraction uh, operation. So when we substitute for sigma, we get essentially uh, a term which is related to the pressure, which is minus P divergence V and the contraction of capital sigma with V, which is often referred to as a dissipation function, the dissipation by viscous, by viscous effect. So uh, in that, for a Newtonian fluid, then the rate of, uh, uh, of uh, change in internal energy is, uh, in, is uh, uh, increased by, uh, this is the increase by compression, divergence V, uh, rate of dissipation of internal energy and the rate of heat transfer, okay? So uh, the next uh, thing is to talk about the heat flux uh, vector and uh, usually uh, we assume Fourier law of heat conduction. Uh, of course, if radiation is important, you have to include it, but uh, I'm gonna uh, skip it for now. So Q should be conduction plus the uh, radiation effect. So, and for conduction, again, we use uh, a law, 
which is not, again, derived, the constitutive relation, which is um, uh, uh, written as the uh, uh, minus a coefficient, the thermal conductivity, multiplied by the gradient of the temperature, namely that heat uh, uh, go from high temperature to low temperature and depend on, the, uh, that's why the minus, and then it depend on the coefficient, depend on the property of the material. So when we add this in the uh, equation, uh, just uh, this fill in this uh, last term. And uh, uh, again, we have here, as you see, internal energy, pressure, uh, temperature that uh, need thermodynamics in order to relate uh, one to the other. Uh, thermodynamics, uh, for a pure substance, the state of a gas is uniquely determined by two variables. For example, density temperature, and so the pressure will be expressed as density temperature, or the internal energy can be expressed to pressure temperature, density temperature, whatever you like, and there will be a relation between the uh, one to the other. Um, the, oops. There are, uh, of course, uh, other thermodynamic relations that come uh, into play. Uh, one of them is the enthalpy, which is defined as E plus P over rho, right? And uh, perhaps the entropy at some point, which can be uh, uh, determined from this uh, so-called TDS relation that you get in classical thermodynamic uh, course. And so for an ideal gas, which is what we will be assuming, uh, you have the equation of state, which tells you that uh, pressure is equal to density temperature multiplied by the uh, uh, gas constant. Uh, R is the universal gas constant, W will be the molecular weight, and so uh, the ratio is the specific gas constant. So again, you see that's the functional dependence of P on rho and T. Uh, another uh, thing for ideal gas is that the internal energy depends only on the temperature, and therefore if you substitute in the relation for the uh, enthalpy, you see that the enthalpy also depends on temperature only. And so the two uh, can define what is known as the specific heats, one of them as specific heat at constant pressure and the other one specific heat at constant volume. Uh, so specific heat at constant pressure, Cp, is dH dt, which you can integrate to get a reference H0, the integral from some reference temperature to T of the integral of Cp. And uh, similarly, E is a reference E0 plus the integral of uh, Cv dt. Uh, uh, in general, for a pure substance, the reference is really not important because you can choose it as, as you please, uh, uh, since what you are interested in is the change in internal energy, the change in the uh, enthalpy. Uh, what is the time? I am a little lost when we started and uh, when is the break? Huh? Two hours. Yeah, yeah, but uh, we started at what? We started at four, uh, quarter two, so it's, okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, so this is uh, a relation between CP and CV can be easily uh, obtained as Cp equal to Cv plus the uh, plus the the, uh, the, spe the specific gas constant, and so clearly Cp is always larger than Cv. Uh, the ratio is usually denoted by gamma, is known as the ratio of specific heat, and of course it's going to be greater than one. And note that this relation can often be used. In other words. When you have the gas constant, you can replace it with a Cp and, a, and gamma with this relation or uh, uh, this relation. Anyway, it's just straightforward things to do. So, uh, uh, so there, uh, the, uh, just a few comments. There are different forms that you can write uh, the energy uh, equation. Uh, for example, we derived it in this form, but it can be also written in terms of the uh, enthalpy H when you substitute the definition. Note that those two terms don't change, but the term involving the pressure takes a different form, whereas 
in terms of the internal energies minus P divergence V, in terms of the enthalpy is the material derivative of P uh, with time. Uh, you can also use the TDS relation to write uh, a, an equation for the entropy, and that's the form uh, it will take. And it's consistent with many of the things that you know about uh, entropy, uh, for example, for an isentropic flow, which means that it's adiabatic and reversible. The change in the uh, entropy should be zero, and in fact it is, because adiabatic means that this term is zero, and uh, if there are no friction, then this term is zero, and so you get it. Anyway, I don't want to extend on this because it's not directly uh, going to be used in my lecture. Uh, and uh, one more thing to note, which leads to the um, uh, speed of sound, is that for an isentropic flow, uh, I'm sorry, for, uh, yeah, for an isentropic flow, you can also derive the isentropic relation, P rho to the minus gamma is a constant. And um, uh, the speed of sound is defined as the P d rho for an isentropic condition, namely when S is a constant. And by substitution, you get that it's gamma P over rho, or you can write it as gamma RT. Okay, so those are the basic uh, relations. So with that, now, uh, what we have is the conservation of mass, momentum, energy, and equation of state, equation of state for an ideal gas. And uh, since I left here the energy equation in terms of H, I wrote the relation uh, of H to the specific heat Cp. Uh, note that what we have is seven variables, three for the velocity, and the P is four, five, six, seven. And so what we need is seven equations. We have one, three is four, five, six, seven. So we have seven equations, seven variables, so we can solve uh, the problem in principle. Okay, now we want to move to conservation equation for a multi-component chemically reacting uh, mixture. And so we're gonna use the ideas or the equation that we have basically uh, derived for a pure substance in order to uh, describe uh, these equations. And so uh, we start with defining the mixture. So the gas mixture consists of N species that is identified with the subscript I. I goes one, two, three to N. Uh, sometimes I will use some uh, script MI for the chemical symbol, for example, hydrogen or methane, oxygen, whatever. Uh, the, we define the concentration as the number of moles of species I uh, per unit volume. So Ci, the concentration of species I, is Ni, the number of moles divided by the volume. And uh, the mass, Mi, of the molecules I is, of course, related to the number of moles via the molecular weight Wi. So Mi is Wi and I. Um, now, uh, uh, the Mass uh, or density rho i is defined as the, ma uh, the density rho i is defined as the mass divided per unit volume. So it's the mass mi divided by the volume. Uh, and if we sum uh, rho i over all the i, uh, the volume is fixed, so it's one over v, the sum of mi, which is the mass of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, total mixture. And so when you divide by v, you get the density of the Mixture. So this is the density of the mixture written ex expressed as the sum of the densities of all the species. Uh, similarly, the sum of the concentration Ci give you the concentration of the uh, mixture. Uh, and so we uh, define a mole fraction or mass fraction as the uh, concentration of a species I divided by the total concentration C or the mass of species I divided by the total mass, M. And uh, so uh, the mole fraction is the number of moles divided by N. The mass fraction will be the density rho I divided by rho. Those are fractions, and so clearly they are number between zero and one, okay? And when you sum over all uh, Xi or you sum over all Yi, you will always get one because of this relation that we have above. Um, 
And so you can also write a relation between mass and mole fraction, which is important that you will see uh, later will be often used. Uh, and so uh, uh, yi is xi wi over w, where w, oh, I didn't define it yet. Uh, okay, so skip that until next slide. <laughs> uh, sorry. So um, here is the total mass written as the sum of all mi. And uh, you can see it can be written as the sum of the, uh, the, the ni, which is the mole fraction times n. So what you see that there is a product of the total number of uh, moles times something. So clearly that should be equivalent to the molecular weight of the uh, mixture. So the molecular weight of the mixture is defined as the sum of uh, the mole fraction xi multiplied by the molecular weight uh, wi. But uh, that's not uh, the same when you use the mass fraction. And so when you use the mass fraction and you use that definition, as you will see here, you express uh, yi in terms of, well, I use that relation. So basically what I wanted to write in this relation that they, they will be, it's not systematic. I should have done it a little different, sorry about that. But anyway, you can show that the, the molecular weight of the uh, mixture uh, is written as the reciprocal of the sum of yi wi, divided by wi. So this is the relation of the uh, molecular weight of the mixture in terms of mole fraction or in terms of max fraction. It's not uh, uh, the same type of relation. Okay, um, now uh, we want to start writing the conservation of mass, and so we focus on species i, and uh, we write the mass conservation uh, for that species, as if the mixture had some, some species uh, colored in blue, and you want to just write the equation for the blue particles. So, um, uh, so it, it, the, it's the time rate of change of rho i, which is rho y i, and everything here was written in terms of essentially the species i. So it's exactly the same uh, uh, conservation uh, uh, equation, uh, mass conservation equation that we have used before, um, that we have derived before. And so uh, V here can be defined, or the total, the mass average velocity of the total mixture can be written as the average of the uh, uh, velocity Vi, namely all those blue particles move at the velocity Vi, which is not the velocity of the total mixture, and so uh, the total mixture or the average uh, velocity of the uh, mixture is the sum of yi vi. It's the mass weighted average, if you like, of the specific velocities. And so the difference between the two, the velocity of the species i relative to the velocity of the bulk is known as the diffusion velocity and is denoted here by capital Vi. Uh, because the sum of yi is equal to 1, I can uh, substitute, uh, I can take the sum of this quantity after multiplying it by yi. Uh, this should be equal to v, and v minus v is 0, so you get one constraint, which is important to remember, that the sum of yi times the diffusion velocity vi over all the species is equal to 0. And... Um, now you can uh, express the conservation of mass in terms of the average velocity or the bulk velocity plus the diffusion velocity. And oh, I forgot to say when I was talking about species i, of course the conservation is not equal to zero as for a pure substance because the species i can be consumed or produced uh, uh, by chemical reaction. And this is the, the term on the right-hand side of the equation. So omega i is the net rate of production of, not production by, not, by the, 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 com the sign convection, uh, production of species i per unit volume per unit time, of course. Now, if we uh, sum all those equations for all i, then uh, since the yi sum to 1 uh, and uh, the yi here sum to 1, the yi vi sum to 0, 
this sum of y i, omega i will be the total net production consumption of all the species, which should be zero. And so uh, what you get is the conservation equation of the total mixture, which is the same as for a pure substance, if you like. Um, the next, uh, uh, oh, and it was written in a conservative form before, which is this. And so again, using the continuity equation here, I have even shown some of those details. Uh, you can eliminate, uh, you can rewrite it uh, in a, well, I don't like that term, in a non-conservative form, but that's what I meant. It's not, uh, it's written directly using rho, the derivative of uh, the species yi. You have the diffusion contribution and the net production. And if you uh, sum all those, as I have noted earlier, you get the continuity equation. So clearly, uh, you don't have here n plus one equation. You have only n equation because one of them is redundant. So among all the uh, species equation, you should really uh, only take n minus one because, uh, which are linearly independent, because always the sum of why I should be equal to one can replace one of those relations. Okay, um, conservation of momentum. Again, we write the momentum for each species and then we uh, take uh, the uh, mass weighted average. When we do that, uh, the term grad P will in, consist of the sum of PI, which are the overall uh, pressure of all the partial pressure of uh, all the species I, which is effectively known as Dalton's law. And uh, the sigma here is gonna be uh, some kind of average again of the individual sigma I, in other words, the viscous stresses of the species I. Uh, if, if you are a little uh, uh, careful, you may ask what about uh, stresses due to diffusion, they may also contribute to that term. The answer is yes, but they are usually very small. They are higher order and negligible. Uh, Fi here uh, is not taken as zero. Fi are the forces on individual species. And um, if Fi is gravity, for example, so it's the same F for all the species, then this term is gonna be uh, equal to essentially rho times the total gravity because the sum of yi is zero, uh, is one. But if they are not the same, then they will contribute differently and I told you that I may show you an example, I have it, I don't know if we'll get to it, where Fi uh, can uh, uh, contribute to this equation. For example, if it's uh, uh, a force uh, uh, due to uh, an, an electrostatic force, say, due to uh, which will act on uh, ions or charged particles. So if we get to it, I will show you that example. Uh, back, so uh, back for one second here. So essentially the conservation of momentum is similar to conservation of momentum that we wrote before for a pure substance, but now for the mixture, uh, except for this term. Okay, in other words, that should be, uh, should pay attention to that. Uh, conservation of energy now is uh, written again as you start with the total energy as before. Uh, here the velocity Vi is split into V plus the diffusion velocity as we did for the momentum equation. And uh, this term again uh, is uh, practically what we have done for a pure substance before, uh, it, it, it inv it's gonna involve the uh, pressure and the viscous dissipation uh, for based on sigma, which is the mixture of value uh, of the stress, of the viscous stresses. Uh, then you have the, the divergence of Q, which we still have to discuss. And you have now, when you split those two terms, uh, you are going to have uh, a term which uh, consists of uh, yi, fi, multiplied by the uh, diffusion velocity. Again, when fi are all the same, 
For example, if it's gravity acting the same on all the particles, this term is zero because yi vi is zero, the sum of yi vi. Otherwise, it may contribute something to the equation. Uh, the, the, I didn't say anything about this term because when you remove the kinetic energy as we did before for a pure substance, you end up with only the internal energy and that term is gone. Okay, so um, these are the equations. Uh, before we take the break, I guess, uh, the mass conservation, uh, an equation for the species yi, uh, the um, momentum equation, the energy equation, and uh, we have used here the constitutive laws that the stress tensor is expressed in terms of the viscous uh, stresses, sigma, uh, or stress is proportional to strain as we did before. Uh, this is the phi, the dissipation function. Uh, note that uh, I wrote phi uh, in terms of index, uh, but since it involved vi and xj, uh, uh, yeah, since it's a squared, then the i is appear twice, so you have to sum over it and the j appear twice because it's squared. And so everything here is summed over i and j, and this is divergence square. Let me see what else is. Oh, here, so here is the note that if the only body force of interest is gravity, uh, fi is g for all the terms, uh, then uh, uh, this term reduced to rho g, the sum of yi, which is rho g, which you will find in your regular equations or pure substance. And uh, this term uh, is gone, is equal to zero. Uh, just a second, let me see where I am. Yeah, so we have, uh, this, we have used the constitutive law for sigma and uh, uh, phi, but we still need thermodynamics to talk about E and P, about the internal energy and the pressure. We need transport in order to talk about the heat flux vector and the viscous uh, and, the, and the diffusion velocity, and we need kinetic, chemical kinetic in order to talk about omega i. Now we have a break. Thank you. <laughs> about thermodynamic transport and the uh, next lecture, chemical kinetics, but there will be some here and there, some addition to these items. Uh, tomorrow we're going to talk about uh, uh, the difference between deflagration and detonations. Uh, then we will talk about uh, essentially from there on about the, uh, about the flames. I will talk very little about detonation, uh, if any. Uh, and uh, I will talk about premix flame, uh, ignition, extinction effect, and some of the uh, idea in, in deriving equations for these phenomena. Uh, the following day, we'll also talk about premix flame, but there'll be more of multidimensional flames, effect of stretch, uh, differential diffusion, and so on. Uh, and then uh, there will be a day focus on diffusion flame primarily. And then um, the last day, I think the last day, uh, I don't know how it's organized. You know better. You have the notes uh, on instabilities and uh, turbulent flames. Again, I want to emphasize that all my discussion will be on things derived primarily from theory. In other words, I'm not going to just dump on you, uh, this guy have derived this, this guy did this simulation, or that guy did this. I'm going to just derive systematically things that we understand from the theoretical development. So the... Uh, next thing uh, is going to be on thermodynamics. Um, so we have n species, and um, uh, the state of a mixture, I don't know why it's smaller, uh, the state of a mixture uh, in, um, uh, if that consists of uh, n fluids uh, in equilibrium is described, which is in thermodynamics, essentially is described by n plus one parameters. Two basic parameters plus n minus one species, right? We only need n minus one uh, properties. 
And so each species, uh, if it's an ideal gas, it satisfies the equation of state, pi is rho i rt over wi. And uh, if you sum over all i, you get the, that's again Dalton's law, you get the pressure p is rho rt, the sum of uh, rho i is written as rho yi, so it's the sum of yi divided by wi, which you have seen before, is the reciprocal of the average molecular weight of the mixture. And so you get essentially uh, the ideal gas law for a mixture. Note, however, that in principle, uh, W is not a constant. Uh, it is, a, it depends on the species, and so it really, in principle, it depends on all the conservation equation, because the species depend on velocity, depend on temperature, and so on, because temperature through density, and so on. So it's, it already complicates the system. That's the point I want to make. Uh, the internal energy and the, and the enthalpy of the mixture are defined as the uh, sum of yi ei or the sum of yi hi. And uh, hi uh, and ei are, uh, for each species, uh, satisfy the relation that we have discussed before, essentially definition of enthalpy. And so when you substitute uh, for the sum, you get that the enthalpy also satisfy a similar relation like uh, we had before, uh, E plus P over rho, but now it's for the mixture. Uh, we can uh, now define also the specific heat for the mixture as the sum of Yi uh, Cpi and the Cv as the sum of Yi Cvi. And, um, uh, the, and uh, for each species, uh, Hi is, the derivative of Hi is defined uh, with respect to uh, uh, temperature, defined the Cpi uh, for each species, and therefore uh, Hi can be written again as a reference uh, Hi uh, uh, subscript zero, the integral of Cpi dt where T naught is the reference temperature, and uh, uh, similarly the Ei. So now the reference value Hi naught and Ei naught uh, are not, uh, cannot be as for a pure substance chosen just arbitrarily because there must be a relation between them and that's quite important uh, in, in, uh, in this uh, uh, context, in the context of a mixture. So we're gonna see that in a minute. So those uh, are these first relation. Uh, then of course uh, you can write uh, H being the sum of Hi, y, uh, yi, yi, sorry, Hi, or Hi, yi, it's the same thing. If I substitute for the enthalpy, uh, the reference enthalpy, which I will call later the enthalpy of formation, but that's a choice that is made, a determination that it's made, but for now it is a reference, plus the sum of Yi times the integral of Cpi dt, then uh, you can, uh, uh, write for the total enthalpy as uh, yi hi naught, the sum over all n, and then uh, this will define for you uh, a, uh, well, the, the definition of Cp from the previous slide. Well, I, I cannot move previous slide anymore. Uh, so here it is, um, from the definition Oh, I didn't find CPs. Uh, yeah, I did. From uh, the definition of CP, then uh, you can write as that as the integral of CP dt. So H will be some kind of uh, values which uh, depend on this reference value plus the integral of CP of the mixture. Note that this integration is essentially done at constant yi, yi otherwise you cannot uh, uh, use that yi CPI is CP as I, as I did. Uh, similarly, E can be written as uh, the sum of Yi, uh, Ei uh, reference zero plus the integral of Cv. And uh, for each uh, individual species, we know that there is this re relation, uh, Hi, uh, uh, so E is H minus P over rho, essentially for every I. So uh, we can replace P over rho with the temperature. Uh, so essentially, the point I want to make here is that those reference values, uh, it's enough to determine one, one of them, then the other one is, is known. One of them, I mean, 
uh, either the HI uh, or the EI. And so um, uh, they are defined for each species. The reference enthalpy is chosen as being the heat of formation at some standard temperature T0. The heat of formation is the heat that evolves or is absorbed when, when one mole of substance is formed from its element in the standard state. And the standard state is, uh, is the form that is stable at uh, room temperature. And so, um, and so um, uh, here are uh, some reference uh, or heat of formation of different uh, uh, substances uh, taken from the book, the book by Glassman. Uh, the the uh, it's, uh, it's expressed either in terms of uh, uh, either, uh, relative, I mean, it's either a molar uh, heat of formation or in terms of mass, <coughs> sorry. So by definition, the heat of formation of the element should be zero. And in fact, you see that uh, the element of formation of uh, uh, O2, oh, oh I don't, uh, here. O2, N2, H2 are all zero. But the heat of formation of atoms, of course, is not zero because uh, it requires uh, uh, heat to break uh, uh, a molecule O2 into O and O. So what you see is the heat of formation of uh, HO is, for example, 15.57 kilojoule per gram. Um, uh, if you look at the table, you see the heat of formation of water. There are uh, two... Uh, two entries here, and in fact the difference is because one of them produced gas, the other one liquid. And so clearly the heat of formation is different, and the difference will be the latent heat of vaporization of, uh, uh, of water. Okay, so this is just to give you a general idea. I'm sure you will see this in some other lecture in more detail and maybe uh, more precise. Uh, knowing the heat of formation, we can define the heat of reaction. So the heat of reaction, the bar here indicate that it's per mole instead of per mass, which I have used uh, before. So it's the difference between the uh, uh, heat of uh, formation uh, uh, of the product minus that of the reactant. So for example, for methane, uh, if you take the difference, uh, the number taken from the previous table, you will get that it's equal to minus 200 point three kilojoule per mole, uh, and um, uh, the, the, the heat of formation of the product is usually less than the heat of formation of the reactant, so when it's negative, you know that the reaction is exothermic. When it's positive, the reaction is endothermic. Okay, to determine the heat of formation at a different temperature, this is taken at the reference temperature because in the table everything was uh, the heat of formation at the reference temperature, which is usually 298 Kelvin as one atmosphere. But if you do it at a different temperature, then uh, you use the relation that we derived before, which is uh, the heat of formation uh, HI naught uh, plus the integral of CPI dt. Uh, capital C here is per unit mole instead of per unit mass that I've used before. So. Uh, you should uh, uh, pay attention to that when you use tables. Uh, what else? Um, and uh, you can find, uh, in, in general, uh, the CPI as well as the CP of the mixture, or function of temperature, and you can find uh, some correlations which are uh, used uh, in, in various simulation and so on. Uh, that uh, they uh, are expressed in terms of a polynomial. The famous one are the NASA files that uh, give you a list of these constant A1, A2, A3, A4. So that's uh, uh, just a comment. Okay, so we finish with the thermodynamics. We have relations now for all the quantities that we were uh, interested that will enter the equation. The next thing to discuss is diffusion. So the diffusion starts with the fixed law of diffusion. Fixed law is a law that is equivalent to, uh, for example, the, the, the Fourier law of heat conduction. 
but applied for diffusion so that species uh, move from high concentration to low concentration. And uh, the law is defined for a binary mixture. In other words, you have two species. So one move into two. And so the, uh, uh, the law is written that the flux due to um, diffusion, which is, if you want, rho 1, v1, okay, v1 being the diffusion velocity, is pro proportional to the gradient of, rho, uh, of uh, y1, of, or if you want, of rho y1, it's the same, and uh, with a coefficient uh, that depend on the species, on the material. So that coefficient is the diffusivity of one uh, into two. If you write a similar equation for two, it's going to be the diff diffusivity of two into one. But in a binary mixture, y1 v1 plus y2 v2 must be zero, and y1 plus y2 is one. Uh, so when you sum the two, on the left you're going to get zero, on the right, you're going to also get zero because the gradient of y1 is minus the gradient. I'm sorry, you don't get zero, but what you get is the gradient of y1 is minus the gradient of y2 because the sum is a constant. And so it ends up to tell you that d12 is equal to d21. In other words, in a binary uh, uh, diffusion, there is only one coefficient of diffusivity, which is the same one into two or two into one. And the uh, uh, can be expressed as just d. Note that this uh, coefficient is a diffusivity. It uh, has units of centimeter square per second. Okay? Meter square per second, but in principle. Okay, so the, diffusi the, the fixed law can be written, therefore, uh, in this form, rho yi vi is minus uh, the diffusivity, the gradient of yi, and the minus, clearly, it's because concentration go from high to low, so it's opposite to the gradient. Uh, if you, uh, uh, for example, just to show you where that leads, if you have only two species, then the two species equation have this form. If you replace the rho, rho y i v i by the, by the uh, by, uh, fixed law, by the gradient, so you get the divergence of gradient y i, uh, now, uh, there is a, probably a mistake here because it should be a minus. Sorry, I told you there are some errors. So anyway, you get uh, essentially what is known as the diffusion equation, which is equivalent to the heat equation, but for concentrations. Okay, so this is for a binary mixture. In combustion, we have a multi-component mixture, and so we have to uh, use a more complicated law. And uh, the, the, the law derived from some uh, you know, kinetic theory or so on uh, is uh, uh, referred to the book by Hirschfelder, Curtis, and Bird, uh, usually expressed as what you see here. It's a complicated relation. First of all, it's not only it's a complicated relation, also it's not expressed as diffusion velocity vi is equal to, or mass flux rho yi vi, as we did before, equal to something, but rather it is implicit. And it's expressed as the gradient of the mole fraction. Uh, the changes, if you like, in the mole fraction are due to differences in diffusion velocities between the uh, different species, vi and vj, uh, with this coefficient in front. Uh, is due to pressure gradient. In other words, difference in pressure can produce uh, uh, diffusion or can produce changes in concentration. Uh, it also due to temperature uh, variation. Temperature variation, again, can produce changes in concentration of a given species. And uh, body force. Difference in body force can also produce uh, uh, con uh, concentration differences. Uh, the temperature gradient part is known as a Soré effect. It is relevant sometimes in combustion study. Very often it's neglected, but not always. Uh, on the other hand, the pressure gradient is always uh, it's negligible. It's usually very small. Differences in body force could be relevant when the Fi and Fj are important. As I told you, I will show you maybe an example later on, which is not in your notes. So uh, uh, it's a complicated relation, but uh, usually if you neglect uh, those 
last three, then uh, what you have is only the gradient of xi equal to what you have on the right here, the first term. And this is, these are known as the Stefan-Maxwell relation. Some people call them Maxwell-Stefan. I don't know really. Uh, I have never looked why the change in direction, but, in, in, uh, but it's Stefan-Maxwell relation. So Stefan-Maxwell relation involved the binary diffusivities dij. In other words, it's the diffusivity that one, uh, that i uh, diffuse into j, but uh, the concentration gradient xi and therefore the velo diffusion velocity uh, uh, depend on all the species, okay? Um, it was proven that uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they, uh, that uh, the diffusivities are uh, um, at least in a dilute ideal gas mixture. Dilute meaning it's not a very packed, so it's not true for liquids, for example. Okay, uh, it's uh, they are independent of concentration. In other words, they are constants that you can determine experimentally, and uh, it was proven that they are symmetric. In other words, dij is dji. Okay. Uh, so the way that determine, uh, you take a two-component experiment where uh, one species, say I, uh, is in a low concentration uh, compared to the second one, and when it diffuses into the second one, that's the di uh, into the j. The j is the big concentration uh, that you determine. Uh, there, you can also use expression derived from kinetic theory for for uh, uh, for the DIJ. So this is the uh, Stefan-Maxwell relation. Um, for, uh, it, it can be easily shown that if you write the Stefan-Maxwell relation for a binary mixture, remember that uh, the Stefan-Maxwell relation here depend on xi, xj, dij, and the difference between the diffusion velocities. So when you write them for one and two, and you use the fact that uh, x1 plus x2 is one, and uh, some of the other uh, relation. Uh, it's not a trivial step, but it can be uh, done quite easily to show that, uh, no, th this is trivial, sorry, the next step. Uh, it can be shown that it's equivalent to a uh, fixed law. In other words, for a binary mixture, the Ma stefan maxwell relation is, is the same as fixed law. But, um, in uh, uh, more, uh, okay, that's a minor comment. But uh, in general, it's, it, it's not, and so it's, it's quite complicated to use in the governing equation because in the governing equation, we have diffusion velocities. So often, people have used something which is called a generalized fixed equation. In other words, they write uh, the diffusion velocity vi depend on the sum of uh, all the gradients of all the other species uh, xj. And then they put a coefficient dij, but this dij is not the diffusivity, is not exactly the diffusivity, those are diffusion coefficients. And in fact, uh, uh, those are often referred to as FIC diffusivity, because this will have a form of uh, fixed diffusion, uh, but um, it can be in fact shown that uh, even for, uh, uh, here is uh, an example taken from Curtis and Bird, where uh, if you use these coefficients, uh, you end up with relation that uh, they, for example, the D11, D, for, this is for a binary mixture, an example. So it end up the D11, D12, D21, D22, are expressed in terms of the diffusivity in this way, which means that this dij are concentration dependent. And they are not pure constants. And so that's, again, one complication if you want to use such a relation. Anyway, uh, there are also expression for uh, ternary and quaternary mixture, but I mentioned that just for reference. Uh, to simplify this com complicated expression, there are uh, two common ways to, to do it. Of course, numerically, you can possibly use the Stefan-Maxwell relation as they are, because it doesn't matter if it's implicit or not. 
but in any more uh, simpler model, you want to have an equation that you can solve, and so you want to have the diffusion velocity reason explicitly. And so um, uh, one of the simplification is to use a dilute mixture. Uh, uh, and so uh, what uh, you assume that uh, your species, uh, the combustion reactants, are within an abundant species. Let's say combustion in air will be in, the abundant will be nitrogen which is large quantity compared to the individual species. Then uh, you can go, oops. Then you can go systematically through the uh, expressions that uh, we had. So if the yi are uh, small for all the i except for the abundant one, which I am referring to as n, so yn is one minus some small quantity, so essentially it's one. Same thing for the xi. The sum of yi vi equal to zero imply that the diffusivity of n is small, but all the others are not. And uh, because from this relation, the yi are the small ones. So the vi are just, there's nothing specified about them. Uh, the average molecular weight is specified by the abundant one, which makes sense, of course. And then when you substitute into the Stefan Maxwell relation, uh, you see in this uh, first relation, uh, all the uh, Vj are small, and so the first term is negligible. And from the second term, you get uh, Xi uh, Vi. Uh, the Xj uh, is going to be... Uh, 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 what happened to the XJ? Um, oh, when it's multiplied by uh, VI, it's uh, get negligible. So the only thing in that sum is only one term, which is the uh, the I uh, uh, species. Now, it's from one to N, only the I contribute to that sum using this simplification. So you end up with XI VI divided by DI N. The, the, the component here is the N which is left because the N gives you, uh, you see in the J, the VN is one. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the VN is negligible, but in this expression, you get DIN and, this is not me. What happened here? It got back, okay. Uh, and so, uh, no, but we skipped something. Ah, here. And so uh, uh, what we end up is with yi vi divided by din. In other words, uh, and so we can rewrite this as yi vi is the gradient of yi din, which is exactly fixed law, right? But you have to understand the meaning of that fixed law. We are talking about the diffusion velocity of a given species in an abundant, okay? And therefore, the diffusivity di is in fact din. In other words, the diffusivity of that species compared to the relative to the bulk, okay? So that's uh, uh, essentially the idea of a, a dilute mixture. Now, uh, from all this relation of all the sum, if you, if you notice here, I wrote that this is equal to that, or it can be simplified, for i goes from 1 to n minus 1. In fact, it's not true for i equal to n. For i equal to n, you will get, when you substitute, a very complicated relation. And so, if you were to write a similar relation for the n, it's going to be a sum here of the complicated, but you don't care for it because y n can be obtained from the difference y, one minus the other y i. And so the, 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 the dilute mixture approximation go to all the species which are in small quantities, okay? Uh, another uh, a common uh, approximation is what is referred to as effective diffusivity. So what you take species I, you write it as a diffusivity, an effective coefficient, 
multiply by the gradient of xi, okay? And then um, uh, you want to determine this effective value. And the assumption is that uh, all the species uh, uh, obtained by assuming that all the species, the diffusion velocity of all the species except that one is small, okay? So when you make that assumption here, what you end up is with essentially that the gradient of xi is equal to uh, xi vi, the sum of xj dij. And if among all those n terms, the i is replaced with uh, the effective and all the others are left as they are, except for the, uh, for the, the, the i, then uh, what you uh, obtain, well, this is a, just a copy of that then essentially you can define what the effective diffusivity is by comparing this relation to the one that you derived here. And you obtain that the effective diffusivity is some combination of uh, all the others depending on the, uh, on the uh, mole fraction of the different uh, species, okay? So it's an expression, if you like, for uh, the diffusivity di, and uh, maybe you like it more because it involves all the other species compared to the previous approximation, which is based only on the abundant. I like the former, but anyway, it's a matter of choice. Uh, uh, both are simplifications. Uh, and again, they can all be used, these two approximations can be used for n minus one species, the N1 or the last one is usually have a complicated relation, but again, we don't need it because it can be, the mass fraction can be obtained from the fact that the sum uh, is equal to one. Okay, uh, so now when we put that in the species equation, uh, whatever the DI is, DI effective or DI, DIN, I am removing the N from my notation, and so I'm going to have a, like a fixed law rho di. But you have to remember, because when we try to interpret a result and compare it to experiment, we have to understand that this di is not just the diffusivity, it's the diffusivity relative to the abundant species. Okay, so this is the simplification of the species equation. And now, how about the heat flux vector? Uh, for a pure substance, we only have heat conduction, but now we have uh, 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 also the, uh, if you take a small parcel of fluid, then you have also the, the fluxes of energy that go in and out uh, the surface through by diffusion. And those are uh, expressed by this term, which is uh, the enthalpy Hi yi vi, the diffusion velocity. So this is the contribution uh, due to the, the in, including the fluxes which are due to diffusion. Then of course you have the heat flux by radiation that if you are interested you add it. I'm just put it here formally. I'm not gonna deal with radiation. And uh, then in principle you have a term which is referred to as a Dufour uh, heat flux. Uh, and uh, th there is a, a reciprocal relation in irreversible thermodynamics that state that if a temperature gradient give rise to diffusion velocity, which we have seen when we wrote the most general diffusion relation, then a concentration gradient must give rise to heat flux. And so uh, this is where uh, this term uh, essentially comes in. Uh, so, um, but it's typically small and negligible, so the only two terms that we are gonna keep are the first two, uh, and when radiation are needed, we can add it. So the heat flux is gonna be minus lambda, the gradient of temperature, which is the Fourier contribution, plus the fluxes due to diffusion. Now, uh, the energy equation, when we wrote uh, so first, uh, uh, remember when we wrote the energy equation in a pure substance, we said that uh, we can write in different forms, in terms of internal energy, enthalpy, or entropy. So we can do that the same here. The only form that I will write is in terms of uh, enthalpy because it's common 
uh, to use that as the energy equation. So uh, all you have to do in the energy equation that we derived before, nothing new is here from the previous relation, just to express E in terms of H plus P over rho. Now, uh, this change is quite obvious because we have done that in a pure substance. The difference between writing uh, the energy equation in terms of the internal energy and the enthalpy is this term, right, in the, the work. And uh, then phi is the same. And uh, the divergence Q, now when you substitute uh, the expression we just wrote before, we have the contribution of conduction. And note that its plus is correct here because it's on the right side of the equation. Uh, minus the, uh, the fluxes uh, uh, due to diffusion, okay? The energy fluxes due to diffusion, which is what we had uh, just in the previous uh, slide. And uh, this is the same as uh, before, the uh, body forces. Uh, and uh, H, which is the, the enthalpy uh, of the mixture, can be written either uh, this relation I showed you before when we talked about earlier about thermodynamics, can be written either in terms of the enthalpy of formation plus uh, the sum of yi, the integral of Cpi, or using Cp for the mixture, okay? That uh, different form of writing is just a choice, if you like, but it leads to, if you use one or the other, it leads to slightly different form of the energy equation. So you have to be careful when you see the energy equation because it can be written either in what I call version one or version two. I'm not gonna go through the details, but just to tell you what the, essentially the difference between the two. So here uh, we uh, used essentially, we wanna express things in terms of the enthalpy of formation in this version. So you see H is expressed in terms of the enthalpy of formation and the, and the Cp, uh, which is here, and uh, then uh, when you take the, the, the material derivative, you get that, right? And uh, here also Hi is written in terms of the enthalpy of formation. When you substitute in the equation that we had before, uh, you, you get two terms that uh, uh, essentially uh, constitute the species equation, which are these two, okay? This one coming from here and this one coming from here. But since uh, the sum of these two being the species equation, or the equation for species i, it's omega i, then uh, that term is omega i h i naught, okay? Uh, and uh, this term here, which come from this, right, the substitution from this, essentially is uh, a contribution of the fact that all the CPI in principle are different, they are not identical. If they were equal to each other, okay, if all the CPI are a constant, say, or are the same for all I, then this term is zero because this is independent of I and the sum of, rho, uh, of, the sum of yi vi is zero. It's one of the constraints. So that term goes away. Now this is one version, and I will tell you in a minute why I am emphasizing this uh, thing. Oh, uh, that was just a comment that if the CPI are all the same and depend only on, uh, and the CP, so I call them CP and it depend on temperature, then this equation reduced to this. This is term is the same here, this is gone. I just mentioned why. These are expressed here. And uh, this term is simply that, right? So this is the more common way that you may see the energy equation, but not the more general one. Uh, that's version one. Version two, uh, in those two terms, you want to keep, uh, uh, and you don't want to introduce the heat of formation, but you just he introduce Hi. Again, I don't want to go through the algebra. It's quite involved, but not involved, but it takes time. But uh, what you see when you rewrite this term uh, for the material derivative, you get uh, just the sum of hi dy i dt, which I brought uh, to this equation to the right hand side here. And from this term, you have also a contribution which is 
OYI, VI, HI, HI, divergence of that, right? HI. Okay, so uh, again, this is omega I from the species equation, and so that lead to this term here. Uh, and this term is very similar to what I had before, which is equal to zero when all the CPI are the same, so the contribution. But you see the difference between this equation and the previous one is the fact that uh, uh, this term is HI omega I, and the previous version was the entropy of formation. So, so we will see later that this is essentially the heat of combustion. But some people call the heat of combustion this quantity. Some people call the heat of combustion when it's the heat of formation, HI naught omega I. So you have to be careful when you read things that what is exactly uh, I mean, this form is usually used in numerics, uh, and so this is what uh, you could, uh, you should pay attention to sometimes. So anyway, that's the only reason I mentioned that. If um, you just replace uh, the the this term, uh, if uh, what is it? If all the oh, if all the CPI are the same, then uh, this term reduces exactly to the previous one. It's easy to show. And so, um, and so that uh, is equivalent. And again, if uh, the, I mean, this should have come with this. If all the CPI are the same, then you get exactly the same equation as before. Okay, so this was just a minor side comment. We uh, were able to derive now uh, equations for, uh, for I mean, we talk about thermodynamics, diffusion, the heat flux. Okay, and so when we put this in the governing equation, we have the conservation of mass for the mixture, okay? Uh, conservation of momentum, again, for the mixture. Note that I just left only gravity in this writing. Uh, the species equation using uh, the dilute mixture approximation where the di is the diffusivity of the species under consideration relative to the bulk. Uh, and um, the energy equation, which uh, is written for under the assumption of all the CPI are equal, as I wrote on top. So you get rho CP dt dt minus diversion of lambda grad t, uh, those terms as before, and uh, this term that involved the chemical reaction rate that we will have to discuss in the uh, next lecture. Uh, and the equation of state, which is P equal to rho RT times divided by the average molecular weight, which is the same as the sum of YI divided by WI. So uh, if uh, the uh, reaction rate, uh, as we shall see, depend on density, temperature, and the various species, in other words, doesn't add any unknown to the problem, then uh, we have uh, one plus N, so it's uh, uh, n plus one, plus two, plus three, uh, plus another three, uh, but uh, this is not n, it should be n minus one, actually. So it's uh, n minus one plus one is n, plus one plus two, and plus three is n plus five. So we have n plus five variable, and we have n plus five equation. One, three, it's four, n minus one, plus four and my n plus three, four, five. <laughs> okay? And everything else is known. So it's important to know that we have a closed system of equation uh, uh, to deal with. Okay. Let me see what comes up next. Oh, although the uh, lambda uh, mu di uh, depend in general on concentration, well, di not quite, this dependence is generally ignored, and the average quantity are used. But they depend on, in general, on temperature and pressure. Uh, so here are their dependence. So the diffusivity di uh, typically are of the form uh, t to some uh, power uh, to the power alpha divided by p. Uh, typically, the value for uh, around uh, one atmosphere. Uh, are quite uh, in this range, and the dependence on temperature is usually uh, between three-half to two. Uh, 
uh, it's taken basically from kinetic theory. And uh, the uh, uh, kinematic viscosity, which is the ratio of mu over rho, again has units of centimeters square per second, uh, also have the form t to the alpha over p, where uh, alpha is of the same order of magnitude. And uh, typically for p equal to one, it falls in that range. Uh, the thermal conductivity, on the other hand, lambda, uh, has the power t to the alpha, where alpha go between a half and one. But the thermal diffusivity, which is again have units of centimeter square per second, lambda over rho Cp, it's lambda divided by rho, okay? And so when you divide by rho, you have another temperature on top. So alpha will be three half, between three half and two. So the molecular diffusivity or species diffusivity, the, um, the kinematic viscosity or viscous diffusivity and the thermal diffusivity are all have approximately the same uh, temperature uh, uh, dependence. And therefore, very often, uh, we can, uh, the ratio uh, is considered uh, approximately constant. So the ratio of the thermal diffusivity to the molecular diffusivity is known as the Lewis number. The ratio of the viscous diffusivity to the thermal diffusivity is known as the Prandtl number and the ratio of the viscous diffusivity to molecular diffusivity is known as the Schmidt number. And uh, typically they don't vary very much. Uh, oh, so because of that, in some theoretical study, what you could do is just write rho di as lambda over Cp, the inverse of the Lewis number, uh, mu as lambda over Cp, a parental number, and so since parental number and Lewis number can be treated as constant, effectively you have only one temperature dependence. So all transport properties can be in a way expressed under this simplification in terms of one quantity, uh, lambda of t. I called it lambda, it doesn't have to be conductivity, it's equivalent to the others. And uh, this is an expression uh, suggested for the temperature dependence of lambda over Cp which is, or in other words, that lambda, which is t to about 0.7. Uh, and the values of uh, Lewis number, Prandtl number, uh, I don't know what's missing there. Uh, maybe you have it in the notes. Uh, the Prandtl number is typically around 0.75 in the Lewis number range between small value like 0.2 to 2, but not much. Uh, in a solid, for example, if you have combustion in a solid, the Lewis number will be very large, will be practically infinite because molecular diffusivity is very small. I think the rental and Lewis number have shifted position. <laughs> okay. okay, now I want to end up, I don't know if it's the end up, but anyway, I want to talk about conservation law for, uh, across an interface because that's quite important for two reasons, as you will see. So the first one is, uh, oh, we will get to, uh, to it. But the idea is this. Uh, you have an interface, uh, which is shown here as the red line, and you want to express the conservation law across, across that interface. Now, I'll be a little bit more specific about this interface later. So what you take, you build a control volume, a small control volume that, um, that include the interface, okay? That uh, the interface is embedded uh, within it. Uh, it's uh, very often referred to as the pillbox argument because it's related to like a little pillbox where you put uh, things. Okay, so um, uh, in principle, the interface may not be fixed. It can move. So it can move at some velocity v interface in some direction. Uh, and um, uh, the normal to the control volume, it's usually the outward normal taken in all discussions. So uh, here it's n plus, I call plus the above and minus below. So if I call n plus as n, n minus is going to be minus n, clearly. It's a unit uh, norm. Okay, so now uh, here are the conservation equations that I want to use. Why did I use, I wrote this one? Because I wrote them in the more general form without 
substituting like the heat flux and things in them, okay? So you see here it's written, and they are written in a conservative form. So this is the uh, diffusion velocities without introducing the specific law. Uh, this is the momentum equation, again, in a conservative form. And this is the energy equation, the total energy, okay? Good. And just emphasizing it to clarity. And I have left here gravity. In other words, I took out the idea that maybe there are different body forces on, on, on the fluid elements. Uh, the, uh, now I want to remind you what I said earlier today, that uh, this, uh, what I called at the time the Reynolds transport theorem, was specifically when the uh, uh, surface move with the velocity of the fluid. But in principle, uh, it's, the relation is correct if uh, this is the velocity of the control surface, okay? Or the, in other words, the control, this control volume move at some velocity vi. So this is the, the relation that tells you the time rate of change of an integral which uh, may change in time because this is going to be things are going through. Uh, is equal to the integral through the volume of the phi dt plus phi, uh, the dot product, or if you like, the normal velocity of, of, uh, of the interface or of the control surface. Okay, so we're going to use this relation uh, uh, multiple times. So the, for example, if we use it for the mass conservation or for the density, then uh, here it is, uh, d by dt of rho dv, is the integral of the rho dt dv plus uh, the in integral through the surface of rho vi. Again, vi is the velocity of the interface dotted with n. Okay, uh, for the rho dt, we can use the continuity equation and so replace this with minus the divergence of rho v. Okay, and then the next step, we use the divergence theorem to write it as a flux uh, across the surface. So it's rho v dot n ds. In a way, you can think of this as being something that I did the inverse of what I did before when I derived the equation, but this is done specifically on this control volume. All right. Now, uh, uh, this term is just rho vi dot n. So now on the right-hand side, we have an integral of the surface, and what is the surface of, of this control volume? It's the two sides, the top and bottom. But being a very small or very narrow one, I'll take the limit when the control volume goes to zero. So the two sides are not going to contribute anything. By the way, this control volume is not taking a, 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 throughout the whole thing. It's effectively a small uh, element on the surface because the condition that we are going to derive are local in principle. They can be applied to the thing if there are no variation along the surface, but not necessarily. So, and uh, I'm going to use a vi without the vector uh, representing the normal velocity of the interface. Usually, an interface is described by the velocity along its normal. And so, uh, when we now uh, uh, take the limit, the first term here on the left-hand side, which is going to be here, uh, it's the limit of a quantity which is finite, and so when the volume goes to zero, it goes to zero. So unless there is a source of mass in that surface, that term is zero. When there is a source of mass, it means that rho is very large or infinite, and that, that's why the product is not necessarily zero. Uh, the two contribution of the surface on top and on the bottom uh, will be uh, the integral rho plus v plus and minus, okay? And uh, since this is equal to zero and so this applied to essentially any uh, uh, volume, and we didn't, it's arbitrary, therefore the, uh, the integrand is equal to zero, and the integrand equal to zero means that the quantity on top is equal to the quantity at the bottom. I forgot here the equal to zero, sorry. And uh, we express that as a jump. In other words, the mass flux relative to the interface, okay, because the interface is moving, which uh, goes in the interface is the equal to the mass flux 
leaving the interface. So this is the conservation of mass across the interface. In a similar way, we want to do the equation for the species. The details are very similar. Uh, again, we are using here the, uh, the expression for uh, the time rate of change of the volume, as I indicated before. And uh, in the, this term here, we're using the species equation. So when we substitute the species equation, we're going to have here the contribution from here. This one is here. And those two terms uh, come from uh, the, uh, well, the, uh, the, the, this is one divergence. Using the divergence theorem, you can write this as a surface integral. And uh, this is the fact that the interface is moving. OK, it's just a direct substitution. So um, uh, I'm going to do a little uh, quick those few so that we leave for the break. Uh, I don't know my watch is, what is, oh, I have three minutes, okay. So um, uh, again, when you take uh, the, I, I didn't drop the volume yet, I moved it to the right, so you have here this contribution from the rho i, rho y i, and this contribution from here, and those are the surface term, which constitute the upper surface and the lower surface. Now. Uh, on the surface, you may have a surface chemical reaction. You occur, for example, in combustion of solid uh, particles where they can burn on the surface. And so then uh, uh, the, this uh, integral here, omega i, which is the rate of uh, uh, production of species i, can be written as omega i, a surface reaction rate, which is omega i hat will be per unit area as opposed to omega i being per unit volume, multiply by a delta function. And in the limit, then, when you take v goes to 0, this will give you a contribution as the surface reaction rate. Uh, this term usually is going to go to 0 unless you have a source of mass which, uh, of the species, which very rarely is the case of interest. So when you, again, uh, take the limit when the pillbox goes to zero, you obtain the following relation. So you have rho yi v plus the diffusion velocity dotted by n minus the uh, velocity of the interface, so relative to the interface. What does this say? It says the fluxes of the convective plus diffusive fluxes relative to the interface are either conserved equal to zero when there is no chemical reaction or are equal to the surface chemical reaction when there is reaction. So this is the second jump relation. If we do the same thing for the momentum, uh, we get uh, the following relation. Uh, steps are identical. Again, uh, the gravity contribution is zero because uh, that's essentially a constant or uh, locally and the volume goes to zero, so it doesn't contribute similarly here. So you get a, a vector relation. Note, Pn plus rho v, v dot n minus vi, minus the uh, viscous uh, stress dotted with n, the jump in this is equal to zero. Of course, you can decompose this into, typically, uh, if you are interested in things around the, no the, the surface, you can decompose this along the normal and the tangential component. So when you do it along the normal, for example, you're going to get n dot n gives 1, so you get a jump in the pressure is equal to something. And you do the surface, you get some contribution from the other term. Uh, anyway, I will not uh, uh, do, I'll comment on this in a few minutes later. Uh, you can do the same thing with the energy equation, and you get this. Very general relation. Note that I left uh, E here as total energy, so this is internal energy plus the kinetic energy. So this is the more general jump that you would have. And uh, you can express it, if you like, in terms of enthalpy instead of energy. And the reason for this is because, again, very often we use enthalpy as our uh, uh, variable in the differential equation. So I wrote here in terms of the enthalpy as well. So what are these uh, jumps uh, used for? So there are various uh, situations. 
in fluid mechanics in general, and uh, of course in our subject as well, where uh, discontinuities are allowed. They are allowed as part of the continuum description. But you cannot just specify anything that you want across the discontinuity. They have to satisfy the conservation law which are described by this jump relation, okay? So an example, if for example, viscous uh, effects are negligible, okay, so sigma is equal to zero, uh, and if I decompose this relation again into normal and tangential, in the normal direction you will get P, uh, and then uh, when you take the normal contribution from this, you get that, so this is the normal conservation of momentum across the interface. The tangential component, n cross n, you cross it with a unit vector n, n cross n is zero, and here what you're gonna get is this crossed n, but since rho v dot n minus vi from the first relation is conserved, then it's a constant, not a constant, but it's independent of ahead or behind, so you pull it out of the jump, and you get the jump of V cross N. V cross N is essentially the tangential component of the velocity, so it tells you that the tangential component is conserved. And the first one is the mass conservation, and those are known as the Rankine-Ugonio relation, for example. If uh, viscous uh, stresses are important, uh, you get all kind of interesting things. For example, you will get what's the uh, difference in pressure, uh, Laplace's equation that describes the change in pressure across the uh, surface of a bubble, for example, which is related to the local curvature, but then you have to introduce surface tension, which was not introduced here. Anyway, uh, this is a, a, a rankine ugonio relation, which are, used, uh, which are uh, useful when you describe, for example, the changes across a shock wave, or uh, when you treat a, a flame as a mathematical discontinuity, something that we will see uh, later on. I'm gonna stop in a few minutes. I just wanna show you one quick more example where these relations are important. Is deriving boundary conditions, or obtaining boundary condition across an interface. So here is an example. You have a droplet which is vaporizing and therefore a mass is leaving as the droplet shrinks. Some, an example that we will talk in the future. The local radius is RS, so it's RS of time. And so if you use the jump relation that mass is conserved, you're gonna obtain a relation that relates the time rate of change of the uh, droplet radius, which is how it shrinks, okay, uh, relative to the velocity of the, which is emanating uh, out, which is the gas velocity the, that vaporizes, okay? Uh, and if you assume, for example, that the uh, uh, ratio of the gas to liquid density is small, you obtain as a direct relation, tell you the time rate of change of the radius uh, is equal to minus the uh, density minus because it shrinks clearly uh, the density ratio times the velocity, something which is used when we uh, study droplet combustion and we will see that. Uh, if you use uh, uh, this relation, uh, the species relation, assuming that there is no chemical reaction on the surface of the droplet, so omega, the surface ra rate are zero, and uh, plus some other assumption, for example, that there is no motion in the liquid, which is not necessarily true, uh, and that, uh, that, that the diffusion in the liquid is zero, is acceptable, then uh, you, out of the, this relation, you obtain, uh, uh, oh, and you use fixed law, then out of this relation you obtain these conditions which are used as your boundary condition for the fuel and the oxidizer. Uh, so the, the droplet is a fuel, then the convective plus diffusive fluxes is equal to the total flux uh, uh, leaving the droplet, and uh, the, the total flux for the oxygen is zero because nothing penetrates, no oxidizer penetrates the, the surface. So all I just want to show you is that these uh, jump relations are very important to obtain boundary condition, not just write boundary condition as you please. Um, which sometimes may be correct, but sometimes you have to examine them. 
And if you do that for the energy equation, and I'll skip uh, some of the details, then uh, you obtain, for example, that the change, uh, the difference in the heat flux uh, between uh, the, the, the heat flux in the gas and in the liquid, okay, which is here and here, uh, is essentially equal to the late, uh, it's related to the latent heat of vaporization. Uh, I think that's it. So that's a stop. I will use this boundary condition when we'll talk about droplet, but of course you can use them even for other circumstances which can be very useful. The last uh, item today is chemical kinetics and uh, everything that uh, is there that I don't understand it's going to be in the lecture this afternoon. <laughs> so uh, anyway, it's not really a, a, a detailed discussion, but it's a brief discussion, one of which uh, because we want to uh, bring in the missing term in the equation that we have derived so far, which is the rate of production consumption of a chemical species which I didn't say anything about. And so... Uh, uh, the representation of chemical kinetics in, in, in at least theoretical studies is usually written in this way, as one relation. Uh, nu i prime and nu i double prime are stoichiometric coefficients. Uh, m i are the uh, different species. And uh, uh, i run through all the species, one to n, all the species. So clearly, if a certain i is a reactant, it will only appear on, uh, uh, so the new I prime will be non-zero, but if it's a product, new I prime will be zero. And uh, if it's a reactant, new I double prime uh, will be zero, and if it's a product, uh, new I prime will not be zero, okay? Uh, which is as you have seen here. Uh, and by the way, this is equivalent to writing the sum of new I prime Wi, which is a molecular weight equal to nu i prime, uh, double prime Wi, the molecular weight, and basically uh, it's, it's, it's a balance, if you like, of all the uh, masses. Okay. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, for uh, a hydrogen plus oxygen going into 2OH, uh, H2 is called 1, this is 2, this is 3. So nu i prime is one, nu i nu one prime, nu two prime is one, uh, but uh, nu double prime one and two are zero. Uh, nu two three prime is uh, uh, is a zero because it's a product and it's equal to two. Uh, the nu i double uh, three double prime is uh, two. Uh, the stoichiometric. The, or the stoichiometry in such an expression on this writing relates the molar production or consumption of a species to each other. So for example, uh, the change in the number of moles of H2 relative to the number of moles of O2 in that reaction is one to one. Uh, or the changes uh, of O2 compared to H2 is two to one. And so uh, you, when you, when you divide uh, the, the, the change in NOH, uh, the change in uh, N of OH divided by two is minus the change in N of H2 divided by one, and the same thing here. The minus, it's because those are products, those are reactants, and so to, to, cl to make that uh, uh, consistent and uh, uh, not thinking about the sign, then essentially you can write it in this way. Uh, the uh, rate of, uh, say, uh, the time rate of change of species i divided by the difference nu i double prime minus nu i prime is related to the similar thing of species j for any pair i and j. So uh, if that is true for any i or j, the, 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 the term or they are all uh, equal to omega, which is referred to as the reaction rate. So the reaction rate is uh, species independent and is in fact the, the rate of consumption of a species where the difference in the stoichiometry is one, okay? 
So, um, for example, for uh, methane oxidation, if you look at the reaction CH4 plus 2, O2, CO2, and water, then uh, the uh, rate of uh, production of water divided by 2, which is the new I double prime minus the new I prime, but there is no, it's only a product, so it's positive, so it's 2. Uh, the rate of production of CO2 divided by 1, stoichiometric is 1, is equal to the rate of consumption of CH4. I don't know what that O is. It's not in my, uh, it's not written here. Just, you don't see it. Divide by 1, and the same thing here, and that's the reaction rate omega. Um, so uh, uh, this was in a molar, uh, uh, in a molar, uh, cons uh, in other words, the molar production consumption. That's why I had those uh, hats. Uh, if, uh, if it's the mass, uh, in other words, the time rate of change of a mass of species I, which I have used in my equation until now, I always refer to mass per unit volume, uh, without the hat, so the relation will be uh, the molecular weight Wi. So omega I for a given species, the time rate of change of that species is nu I double prime minus nu I prime, multiplied by the molecular weight Wi, multiplied by, uh, multiplied by the reaction rate omega. And the units will be some uh, mass, gram per centimeter cube per, vol per time, volume per, per unit volume per unit time. The sum of all omega i can be summed and should be equal to zero as it should because uh, I told you that that relation is essentially the way that we wrote the chemical reaction when it's the, all the terms are properly balanced. So, um, uh, and we, in fact, we used that before when we showed that the sum of all the species equation is equal to the conservation of mass. So uh, the only thing uh, that is left to determine is the rate or the reaction rate omega, because then all the other omega i in each of the equation will be expressed uh, uh, relative to omega. So um, uh, some comments, I think, first come. So first of all, the representation CH4 plus of, of, of methane oxidation is really a gross simplification of actually what happened in reality. I'm not going to discuss uh, all the kinetics uh, scheme because practically I don't know any of them. <laughs> That's referred to others. Uh, but the, the idea is that uh, uh, the uh, molecules of CH4 and O2 uh, break into, uh, you know, they, they, uh, there are many steps involved in, in between. Okay, uh, the second comment, and so those, uh, actually this is what I was going to say, so they involve intermediate species, some radicals, some free radicals, like, uh, for example, CH3 are radicals, OH are radicals, hydroxyl, free radicals like hydrogen atom and oxygen atom before the final product is, is produced. And uh, what's the third relation? Uh, well, it's a comment that um, most of the elementary reactions are bimolecular. In other words, they involve two molecules, but sometimes they are thermolecular, involve a third body, which is usually the, the determined by M, third body could be just some inert, which is not related to the chemical reaction, or some other things that affect the chemical reaction, but it's not a reactant. Anyway, I don't, uh, I put those comments, I also put here an example of uh, breaking the bonds of hydrogen and oxygen that may involve elementary reactions, some uh, like a chain initiation where uh, two radicals uh, produce like H2, two or H2 collide and produce uh, H and H, okay? Uh, or a chain branching when uh, they uh, form more and more radicals like OH and H from one radical. Or a chain propagation like uh, uh, the, you get the net creation, uh, creation of radicals uh, uh, through the reaction. And finally, it should terminate into giving you the, the product. Anyway, just wanted to point out that there are many elementary chemical reactions that are involved 
uh, in a chemical reaction. And this is the key point, the law of mass action, which is again, uh, it's an empirical law, uh, is um, uh, usually, uh, uh, it tells you the rate of an elementary reaction, not of the global reaction, elementary reaction. That's the main point I wanted here to bring up. And so it, uh, it's a rate constant, uh, K. It's called constant despite the fact that it depends on temperature because chemists usually compute those or calculate, uh, uh, measure those at uh, some isothermal condition, but uh, usually it's a function of temperature, uh, multiplied by the concentration of all the reactants, but the reactants sometimes appear like two times uh, a certain reaction, and so the two, therefore, should product of one times the same, and so it will be raised to a power. So it's raised to the power nu i prime. So it's a concentration, I said, of all the reactants, despite the fact that the product here is the product over all n, but remember that nu i prime is zero if it's a product, and so that's exactly only the product's concentration of all the reactants. So this is the uh, law of mass action. Uh, so for, for example, for such elementary reaction is gonna be the concentration of the O multiply the concentration of CH2, and here it's the concentration of CO square, of, I mean, the concentration of O, not CO square, uh, times, uh, if you want, the concentration of the uh, third body, but sometimes the uh, concentration of third body is included in the rate K, so uh, that's a detail that it's not uh, something uh, I will uh, discuss. So not necessarily, uh, this is not necessarily true for the global reaction. I cannot in principle write that the rate of this global reaction is, uh, is written as the concentration of methane multiplied by the concentration of uh, of oxygen, okay? Just an important point to, to make. Uh, what about the, uh, here is just uh, a comment actually. Uh, I did that just for one important comment. Suppose that you have a unimolecular uh, step like A go to B at the rate K, for example, like O2 break into 2O or H goes to O plus H. Then you have a, under homogeneous condition, you have a simple one-dimensional uh, ODE that tells you that the rate uh, of change of the concentration of A is minus K times the concentration of A, right? So it's a simple first-order ODE. Say you know the initial condition, so uh, you know the initial concentration, so essentially the concentration is an exponential in time. Or you can write it as a log of the concentration divided by the initial value is minus kt. So if you plot the log as a function of time, you get a straight line and you obtain k experimentally as the slope of this line. The main reason I wanted to mention that is to just indicate that in fact k is like, a, a, it's, a, it's a reciprocal of a characteristic time scale. And so uh, the, the time scale is going to be of, the, of this reaction, which is essentially the time that it drops to something almost negligible. Uh, it's, uh, it's the reciprocal of K. So all the rates are effectively like uh, reaction time, uh, representing reaction times. Okay. What about the uh, constant uh, K uh, reaction constant? So Usually we adopt the Arrhenius law, which tells you that it has an exponential dependence on temperature of the form e to the minus uh, e over RT, e being an activation energy, R is the gas constant. And uh, there is a, uh, often a, a, a temperature dependence of the free exponential factor or the frequency factor, which indicate uh, the likelihood that molecules uh, uh, I mean, the, essentially, the, the whole expression uh, uh, indicate the probability that a collision between molecules lead to a reaction, and so it depends on the direction uh, that, uh, that they uh, collide and so on. Anyway, it's beyond what I want to discuss. 
So uh, this is the Arrhenius law, and essentially show you that uh, if this is some reaction coordinate and this is the energy, so the reactant have to overpass a certain uh, level of energy, which is referred to as the, as the activation energy, before they produce, uh, before the reaction go into the product. And of course, the difference in that energy is the heat of uh, the reaction, or the change, say, in the enthalpy, the rate of the reaction. So again, as we said earlier, when it's uh, in last lecture, when it's uh, negative, it's an exothermic reaction. Okay, so for our purpose, we now finally have an expression for omega, and um, uh, the rate, the reaction rate, is therefore it has the Arrhenius part with the exponential dependence, and uh, the product of the concentration of all the species which are involved in the chemical reaction uh, raised to the power nu i prime, or just the product of all the... Okay, but this is true for an elementary reaction, so if you have uh, uh, m such uh, steps, then uh, you have to uh, uh, look at the rate in all those steps, and you have a summation over all the m, uh, so I wrote the expression, but I'm not going to deal with this uh, much. I want to just quickly go through one thing about the hydrogen bromine reaction. Uh, I'm not sure why I did that at uh, this uh, now, but I will see in a minute. I don't just remember the sequence of my uh, slides. So, uh, th th these are the, say, the known step, K1, K2, K3, K4, K5, represent the rates. Uh, so uh, you have the chain initiation in the beginning, you have chain carrying uh, in the next three, and termination, the last one. Uh, the one thing you want to note is that when you sum uh, all these uh, steps, it should give you the overall reaction. So it does, uh, provided, of course, you uh, one of them has to be multiplied by two, the second one. In other words, uh, twice the second one plus all the others give you the overall reaction. And uh, you may have noticed that some of them, like step four and five and two and one, uh, are backward, forward and backward reaction of the same, but in this writing, we always like to write in one direction, so we shows them as two, two steps. Uh, okay, there are some other minor comments. You can uh, uh, read them by yourself. Uh, so I wanted just to, I put that in, is just to, to show you that because there are multiple steps, you have to sum over M. The expression I wrote in the previous slide was rather complicated, but it's much easier to look at it here. So the time rate of change of the hydrogen bromine uh, is equal to, well, it's not involved in the first reaction, so it's not uh, relevant. It's a product here, so it's going to be K2 times the product of Br and H2, which is this. It's a product in the third reaction, so again, it's K3 times the product of H and Br2. And it's a uh, reactant in the fourth one, so it's going to be minus K4 times H, the concentration of H and HBr. So I just want to show you an example where you used uh, the multiple. Although I will come to this hydrogen bromine for one more thing later. Okay, uh, two important questions in chemical kinetics that we are concerned about is uh, first to determine all the elementary step involved in a chemical reaction. For example, I told you before that uh, um, uh, if, uh, if you, methane oxidation doesn't just go in one step, so what are all the uh, detail uh, step? And to determine the specific rate constant for each of those steps, which is important in describing the chemical reaction rate. Uh, so, for example, to show you that it's quite involved, I brought here uh, the detail mechanism uh, that was proposed by Warnots uh, of... Uh, uh, of CH4, uh, it started with uh, uh, 200 elementary step. When I say it started, I'm not sure that that's the really where it started, but at least uh, when he considered that, 
uh, I don't know if there are more, uh, but he reduced it to 31. How was this done? I'll probably I'll mention that later. There are different ways of looking at this. The first and foremost is intuition and knowledge about this reaction. Then you know what is important, what is not important. And then there are uh, uh, some steps like uh, chemical, uh, some, um, uh, you know, react. Well, we will discuss that in a few minutes. Uh, one thing that I wanted also to note, uh, that you to note, is that the rates uh, are, are very, uh, the, the, uh, the range of the rates are very disparate. Uh, for example, it goes from 10 to the 2, 10 to 14. Now remember that the rate is the reciprocal of the time scales, as I just showed in a simple example before. So really the time scales involved are, are, are very large, very are huge, from 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 14. So the differential equation that involved in studying all these rates are very stiff. Okay, so that's one point I wanted here uh, to make. Uh, this is just a, a slide taken from a paper by uh, uh, Ed Law and Lou, uh, where they show how uh, the, in realistic or for real uh, fuel and for biomass fuel surrogate, uh, the number of uh, reaction and the number of species can go to the thousands and can be huge. So just to point out how complicated the thing is. So reduced mechanism, that's the comment I started saying before. Uh, you want to model an overreaction with less number of steps, less species. And so, of course, the simplest one, and you will see that I will adopt that after today's lecture, is one global step. Fuel plus oxygen go to product, okay? But of course, we'll have to be careful how we interpret certain things when we do that. Okay, uh, it's very useful in theoretical studies. Uh, there are schemes um, uh, that uh, have been developed by some, uh, some uh, uh, you know, people in the, in the, that you can find in literature, primarily the group of Peters, Williams, Shadri, where they have tried to reduce a certain mechanism uh, into few steps. Let's say there is a four step, six step for methane oxidation, I think, and uh, something similar from some other hydrocarbon. But uh, you see those uh, schemes are used basically to understand uh, uh, the chemistry that is involved. They have used it uh, occasionally to uh, perhaps uh, uh, improve a relation of uh, flame speed, uh, flammability limit, some basic properties uh, using those schemes. Um, okay, so that's one type of activity. Uh, uh, more elaborate schemes require uh, a numerical simulation, uh, but uh, they are complicated because, as I said, there are many equations, many species, so it require uh, a huge memory. The equations are very stiff, and uh, so the, the, there are various, uh, I don't know what I meant by computational cycles, but anyway. Uh, so the strategies, this is the point I wanted to put in this slide, is first of all intuition and experience. Uh, there is a, a, an attempt to try to understand importance of steps by doing a sensibility analysis. Essentially, what is done is that you, you measure the response of a perturbation of, a para of the parameters to serve an indication how important is uh, uh, these steps or not. Uh, if you want interested in that, you should look the, more the literature on this. I'm not really very familiar with that. Then there are some uh, more uh, old and theoretical approximation known as steady state approximation and partial equilibrium. And then uh, there are some uh, more advanced, uh, uh, recent, I would say, or more relatively recent computation and methodology that try in a more systematic way to uh, reduce uh, uh, the scheme in a certain way. Uh, 
Uh, and those involved like the ILDM, Intrinsic Low Dimensional Manifold, uh, essentially by uh, Pope and Mass, or Mass and Pope, uh, computational singular perturbation, which uh, started really by uh, uh, Harvey Lamb, who used to be here at Princeton, and then was carried out with uh, one of his students, Gussis, and some other people. And uh, then you have some other similar things which have given slightly different names and so on. I will touch on all those things very little, just to give you an idea if you are interested what to do, but not uh, really in any detailed way. So I want to start with a steady state approximation for two reasons. One, just to give you the idea, but two, also to make a point. Uh, and so here is again the hydrogen bromine reaction, and we said that they sum up to the total reaction, the one step here like this. Uh, and so if we look, for example, at the time rate of change of the consumption of uh, bromine, uh, here is the equation. Well, I chose before something, the, the product of it, it's the same thing. So again, we can see that the time rate of change of the, cons of the consumption of bromine, uh, first of all, it's, it appeared in the first uh, equation, right? Uh, as a product, so it's going to be 2, because the new I double prime is 2, um, times K1, and the concentration of the reactant, which is Br2. Again, I did not include the third body. Think of it as being involved in the rate, in the K1. Uh, in the second relation, it's a reactant, so it's K2, uh, times the concentration of BrH2. In the third reaction, uh, it's a product, so again, it's K3 times the product of the concentration. In K4, uh, it's a product, so it's there. And uh, here it's a reactant, so it's uh, minus uh, 2, because the new I prime is 2, right? Uh, times, uh, uh, what did I do here? Uh, yeah, the concentration of Br squared. So, uh, so, so this is the, uh, the, the time rate of change of the concentration of Br. But you notice that Br is produced in some steps and consumed in other. And so if I uh, separate the two, uh, we see that uh, uh, the, the idea of the steady state cons uh, approximation is that uh, the rate of uh, production and the rate of consumption overall are both large compared to uh, the DR, the time rate of change of BR. In other words, they effectively uh, balance uh, each other so that uh, the time rate of change uh, is approximately zero. It's very small. Uh, the idea is, therefore, that uh, instead of a differential equation, you end up here with an algebraic equation which is this equal to that, okay? And if you do that on other uh, uh, radicals, okay, like Br, same thing, you get another relation, another algebraic relation. So out of those two algebraic relations, you get two relations for the concentration of H and the concentration of Br. Here is Br, here is H. In terms of uh, uh, Br2, which is uh, uh, essentially the... Uh, the reactant, and HBr, which is the product. So uh, uh, if you want to write a, um, for the time rate of change of the production of hydrogen bromine, you get uh, uh, this is the rate. And if you replace the concentration of Br uh, here with this uh, expression and the concentration of H here and here with this expression, you get the rate that depends only on the reactants, okay? But look how complicated the rate is. It's not a simple mass law, uh, uh, you know, like the, the law of mass action, okay? So this was really the key thing I wanted to point out, that's all. In fact, uh, it can be approximated to something similar to the law of uh, mass action, 
Uh, if you assume, for example, that the rate K4, if it's true that the rate K4 over K3 is very small, and so then the denominator is one. But then if you do that, then uh, the, uh, look at the powers are not the stoichiometric coefficient. They are some just, some just general number, one and one half. So, so uh, the basic idea is that sometimes when you write a global reaction, uh, then uh, the powers that you put in the, uh, uh, that you, the, the concentration are raised with are not necessarily the stoichiometric co uh, coefficient. They are some uh, empirical number that are obtained from experiment, from knowledge, from what have you. Okay, and they can be, in fact, and they are uh, referred to as reaction order. So you talk about the reaction order with respect to species I, and the sum of all the Ni is known as the overall reaction order, so it's the overall reaction order of the reaction. But uh, the Ni could be, uh, could be fraction and could be even sometimes negative, it depends on how the empirical relation that you have give you, and I'll show you an example later from a quite uh, popular uh, uh, cited paper that was done actually at Princeton. Um, so, so we can write the rate of consumption production now, similar to what we did before, but with the uh, powers here raised to some Ni, empirical, not necessarily the stoichiometric coefficient. However, uh, the important comment here is that still the coefficient in front uh, here that tells you how much is consumed and produced should be the stoichiometric coefficient, okay? So it's only in the powers uh, here that uh, they are replaced by some uh, other numbers. So this is uh, the, uh, the example, the first example of uh, uh, steady state approximation. Uh, there is another approximation used, which is the partial equilibrium, which is very similar, but it applied to a reaction that uh, has a backward and a forward step, and I'll let you look at that by yourself, uh, and then there's a whole discussion about this in the literature that you can look. Anyway, I want to quickly talk about the com some computation methodology, nothing in detail, just to point out different approaches. So uh, first of all, suppose that you have a homogeneous system. So you are involved with the time rate of change of the concentration. Uh, C will be a vector that involves all the species, C1 to Cn. And uh, uh, on the right-hand side, you have all those rates, which are, in fact, uh, some complicated function, nonlinear, of the concentration, okay? So you have a... Uh, a, a, a system of ODEs to solve like this. Say you know initially uh, the, the concentration and the idea is to find the concentration later on. Uh, the, because there is a whole range of scale, these equations are very stiff and uh, they are highly nonlinear, so they're difficult to solve. Uh, and, uh, but they can be uh, minimized uh, if some of them get equilibrated very fast. And so this is the idea of this uh, numerical methodology, is that, um, uh, is that uh, uh, when they get equilibrated very fast, you only want to resolve the, uh, the one that, uh, uh, that uh, are on a slow time, that proceed on a slow time. Uh, just to point out that such method achieved quite efficiency uh, in spatially homogeneous system, which has been tested against, uh, I guess, uh, various uh, you know, situations which are known. Uh, but when you add transport, uh, convection, diffusion, and fluid mechanics, uh, it's still uh, something that needs to be done. <laughs> it's still in the making. It's not... Okay. Uh, the idea of uh, uh, some of this idea is the following, that uh, when they get equilibrated very fast, you have a manifold. Say in three dimension, it's a surface, and uh, the, this represents a very fast uh, reaction. And uh, then, uh, 
But in principle, what you are solving in this system of uh, nonlinear ODEs, for each uh, concentration, say if you have in three dimensions C1, C2, C3, this is the phase space as it's referred to, uh, what you want to describe if you start with some initial condition, which is a point here where you know initially those three values, you want to describe what is referred to as a trajectory. And eventually, the trajectory will go to some equilibrium. In fact, uh, it, there are some proofs that for chemical reactions by Zeldovich and Aris, that uh, a unique stable equilibrium always exists when uh, those C are restricted to values that are physically realizable. So essentially, you want to get eventually to this equilibrium. So if in the way of getting the equilibrium, uh, uh, there are some steps that are very fast. They sit for a long time on this manifold. So you don't have to worry about them. You know the manifold. All you have to worry about is the one th uh, about the, 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 the on the manifold. Let me show an example. So it's, for example, here, if you start in this initial condition, and uh, the exact, let's say, trajectory is like this, and it goes into this manifold, well, this is very fast, so you can uh, immediately project this point into the manifold, and all you need is just the manifold. And the manifold is a, it's an algebraic relation, so it's simpler. So this is just a general idea. And this is essentially the main idea of the ILDM. Uh, they, all this method use uh, the fact that, uh, uh, use uh, the fact that uh, locally, you can uh, uh, determine the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of uh, the, uh, essentially, the matrix that is obtained by the local representation of the nonlinear term F. Uh, so in other words, you can, local, you can look. Uh, that's uh, the main idea of ILDM. What you do, uh, you, you, you write like a Taylor expansion of those equation around the equilibrium point. And so you are left with the Jacobian, which is uh, a matrix that represents the gradient of that function f. And uh, this Jacobian, you can determine the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. The eigenvalues are essentially the reciprocal of the time scale. And so you can determine what is fast and what is slow. How do you determine what is fast and slow? You imagine one number, another one imagine another one. In other words, there is some ambiguity in this. Uh, but still, it's useful because there's still some sense what is fast and low. But I'm saying it's not a precise thing. And um, uh, then there are some other methods like uh, the one, uh, where is this, the CSP, uh, that uh, uh, what you have to do is to compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors at each time step, okay? Because eigenvalues, eigenvectors are determined for a constant matrix, not for a matrix that change. And so, you, and then you determine something like uh, what are the uh, active and not active uh, uh, elements uh, of that uh, scheme. Uh, anyway, it's complicated. I don't know much about it. I don't want to. I want to move on. So um, in, in summary, uh, those were the equation. I spent more time than I wanted to to describe uh, what this term and this term would be, okay? which is what I started with. So we know what omega i are, and uh, then what is this term? So uh, here is for a one step overall chemical reaction of this form, omega i we found that is uh, related to the reaction rate, uh, the stoichiometric coefficient, the molecular weight. And uh, when you substitute this in the term which appear on the right-hand side of the energy equation, you get that effectively it's a difference between the uh, enthalpy of formation of the uh, product minus the reactant. So it's a negative, uh, which is essentially the, the negative of the reaction of the heat of reaction, okay? Or the heat of combustion. So anyway, this term minus that sum is Q times omega, where Q is a number that you can find tabulated. And omega is given by the reaction rate, which is of this form using the Arrhenius form, 
where the ni are, again, some empirical numbers, not necessarily the stoichiometric coefficient. So this is the, I could have started with this. I spent an hour <laughs> just giving you different uh, ideas of where it come from. So here are the two terms. I put them in blue. So now these are our equation. Uh, we will consider in the future uh, primarily a two reactant mixture, the global reaction of this form, new F fuel plus new O oxidized go to product. So there will be only new NF and NO, only two numbers. Very often will be taken to be one, but not always. And um, uh, in, uh, in the species equation, then uh, there will be uh, a, a new I, W, I, omega, where uh, I run for fuel and oxidizer, and the product is obtained from the fact that the sum is one, okay? So this is simplification. A uh, few uh, quick comments. First thing is about stoichiometry. So uh, we already talked earlier that there's a relation between the uh, consumption of, uh, of of the, the one species I to another one J, and uh, we wrote it in terms of uh, change in moles, but you can also write in terms of change in mass. Uh, mass will be rho yi, rho yj divided by the molecular weight, and then the rho cancel out, so it's essentially this relation. So if you now uh, use a global reaction, as I told you I would, uh, then uh, this relation can be written as uh, dyf, new F, WF equal to the change in YO, new o, y, uh, W. So when you integrate this from some initial state, which I uh, refer to as subscript U, unburned, up to a later state, then this follow that, it's obvious. And uh, uh, if, uh, so here is the relation that I wrote before. Uh, so if the mixture, the mixture is referred to as a stoichiometric mixture, uh, if the fuel to oxidizer ratio is such that both reactants are entirely consumed. So YF is zero, YO is zero. YF is zero, YO is zero give you the relation that the ratio of YO to YF initially, the unburned, uh, is a stoichiometric mixture, is given by the if you like the mass weighted stoichiometric coefficient, which is nu O, W O, nu F, W F, which I denoted by nu, and that will be my notation in the future as well. And so, uh, but sometimes YF and YO in a given mixture are not such that they are more than the stoichiometric or less than the stoichiometric. So we define the equivalence ratio, which is the ratio of uh, the fuel to oxidizer divided by the stoichiometric proportion, and this is known as the stoichiometric, uh, the equivalence ratio. Uh, it's equal to one, as you see from this two uh, being identical when the mixture is uh, in a stoichiometric mixture. It's lean when phi is less than one, it's rich when phi is bigger than one, and usually we use lean and rich uh, relative to the fuel. Uh, the next quick thing I want to bring in, the adiabatic flame temperature. Uh, if a given combustible mixture is made to approach chemical equilibrium by means of isobaric, in other uh, words, under constant pressure, uh, adiabatic process without any heat losses or anything, then the temperature which is finally attained in this mixture is known as the adiabatic temperature. And uh, the notation will be T sub A. So uh, if it's uh, adiabatic and isobaric, then the change in enthalpy is zero. So enthalpy of the unburned is equal to enthalpy of the burn. And you can express that in terms of all the species, yi, because h is the sum of yi, hi. So here it is. And then uh, uh, you can express the enthalpy hi in terms of the enthalpy of formation plus the integral of Cp dt. So this is the next step. And then uh, I take the difference between this term and this, or this term and this term, which is on the left, equal to the change uh, in, the, uh, in the enthalpies of the product of the burn minus the unburn. 
Uh, and uh, note that CP is essentially the sum of CPI, YI, and so on uh, for the two expressions. Okay, now I want to go back to this relation in a minute, which is here. Uh, hmm? uh, yeah, but be before, which is actually here, but before that, uh, I want to do this for a one uh, step global reaction where I will choose, uh, remember in the previous one, how do I go back? Yeah, uh, I used here uh, uh, for any I and uh, uh, any species, no, it's not this relation. It's a relation I had before, in the slides before. Sorry about that. So two, uh, there is a relation between the consumption of two species I and J, it was earlier. So if you use uh, uh, for J to be the fuel, so I replace this with the fuel, and uh, uh, I call new I, uh, new, new prime, new fuel, there is no product, so I forget the prime for simplicity of notation. Anyway, you get that the difference between Y, I, unburn and burn is given by this, and uh, uh, essentially, uh, you can, uh, what did I, okay, this is the expression I had in the previous slides. All I wanted is to evaluate the left-hand side. Basically, when you evaluate it, you obtain that it's related to the uh, heat of uh, the heat of combustion. So, so the difference here between the CP on the burn and on burn is equal to, is related to the heat of combustion. And uh, if I chose the reference temperature to be the unburned value, then this integral will be from unburned to burn, which is written here. So essentially, this expression gives you, uh, it, it's an equation that if you know Q, you can calculate the adiabatic flame temperature. It's written here in a mass base. If you write it on a molar base, it takes a simpler form. I think it's here. It's written, no, I didn't write it. Uh, if you write it in, in molar base, it take a, uh, actually, yeah, it is. It takes a simple form like this, so the integral from unburned to burn of the mole, C, of the CP in the mole, which can be written as the number of mole times the CPI, uh, is, uh, uh, that's the left-hand side is equal to Q. So the idea is that it's given, the TA is given implicitly in that way. So you have to iterate uh, because you don't know what the product, so you have to iterate until you get the, the temperature. So this is a standard classical stuff. All I wanted to really extract from here is that uh, uh, I can write, uh, if I assume that uh, CP is a constant, uh, then I can write analytical expression for the adiabatic flame temperature. And it's written as Tu plus the heat release multiplied by the mass fraction of the fuel divided by nu F Y F. Uh, if it's uh, lean and of the oxidizer if it's rich, okay? And of course, when phi is equal to one, the two expressions are identical because YFU divided by YOU is equal to the ratio of the denominators. And so that's, and uh, essentially that expression tells you that in terms of phi, the adiabatic temperature will peak uh, near one and uh, it will have a form like this. And here are some uh, uh, numerical evaluation of different uh, fuels uh, taken from uh, Ed, Ed Law's book uh, on combustion. Okay, uh, so my important thing was to identify this as being the analytical expression when CP is constant. Um, ah, okay, so I have uh, 10 more minutes, so I will use uh, less than that to give you this example that I told you I will, uh, where uh, 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 body forces on different species may be relevant. So the example involved ions and electrons in the presence of an electric field. So, um, so here are uh, uh, hydrocarbon and fuel often lead to the creation of ion and electrons. 
three element, uh, elementary reaction like this are among the most important one, apparently, according to some uh, studies in the, in the literature, uh, uh, are important one for the creation of ions, where CH radical is the main precursor of this reaction. So you see that the CH plus O here create a positive uh, generated uh, uh, species, an electron, and then you have and then you have uh, um, another creation here and then uh, you have a recombination of these. So such steps are involved sometimes in, in a reaction. So the, uh, if in the presence of an electric field, the force Fi is essentially uh, given by uh, these, the, the charge Qi of the species, okay? Uh, this is the Avogadro constant and divide by the molecular weight, and it's uh, related to the electric field. And I put here an SI because among all the I in the, uh, uh, all the species, some of them are neutral. They don't no electric force act on them, so SI is zero, and some of them are uh, positively or negative forces, depending on their charge. And so there is a plus or a minus. Uh, anyway, it's uh, the main thing I want to show you is that these forces enter somehow in the reaction in the chemical uh, in the governing equation. Of course, nothing enters in the mass conservation equation, so it's irrelevant. But for the momentum equation, uh, remember we had a term like y i f i, and so uh, it will involve some of these uh, contribution in that sum, so that sum is not zero as it would be if it was just gravity. And this is, all, uh, this is often referred to as ionic wind. It, it is a force that, uh, well, it's a net force of the, both the positive and negative charged species, which can modify the pressure gradient in the field, okay? But of course, it will only affect it only near the reaction because that near the reaction zone because that's where the reactions are but it can shift things in, in a certain way, one way or another. Um, the species equation involved the diffusion or the Ma Stefan Maxwell relation that I wrote in the last lecture, plus this extra term that we neglected. But now if we incorporate this term, and if we use the dilute mixture approximation that I have discussed uh, in the previous lecture, namely, that all the species are in small amount compared to the bulk, which I referred to as N, then uh, what you get is in addition to the, uh, the fixed law, right, where the DI was the DI relative to the bulk N, uh, you get an extra term here which is uh, related to uh, these forces, okay? Uh, of course, it's only relevant when SI is not zero. In other words, for the active, uh, the active, for those that are electrically conducting, um, and uh, the, the, this is the diffusivity, and uh, the other, and this is the. the I, I told you before, it's the, the charge, uh, QI. So uh, uh, then you have to uh, introduce. Uh, an Einstein relation, which relate between, for a given species, it relate between diffusivity and the mobility kappa i. So the ratio of diffusivity to mobility is a function of temperature, and it's written this way. Uh, and Kb is just the Boltzmann constant, which is r over n a. So anyway, the key point that I wanted to show you here, that if you, uh, uh, in, instead of just fixed law, which involved the uh, uh, VI here is the diffusion velocity, remember, essentially was written this way. Uh, you have an additional term which is, can cause a drift uh, due to these uh, uh, charges. And so now the species equation involved in addition to the diffusion term, a term related to the electric field that you have, of course, to solve in addition to the appropriate Maxwell equation for E. 
And uh, even uh, the energy equation may have some contribution of this term because you have this product of FIVI, which now uh, involve also that uh, drift. So there is work done by the electric field on each of the charged species by pushing them in the direction of the electrostatic attraction, attraction either positive for, and, and, and that's a term turn out to be positive. Um, so it's an energy source. And then there is another, you know that I can split those into two, uh, one which has a positive and one which may have a positive depending on the net. So anyway, it's not a detailed uh, discussion of any specific example, although uh, the specific example was uh, in the reference that I brought up uh, uh, above in this reference here, um, but um, it was actually on a droplet and we were considering some uh, experimental result to try to understand what the electric field affected them. So uh, the main point I wanted to make is that when I say earlier that we neglect the term, we neglect the term, well, sometimes we have to bring them back because they could be relevant in some studies. I think that's the end of today. Uh, as I told you, tomorrow we are going to talk about the uh, premix flame. We're going to start with the uh, planar premix flame and derive, oh no, actually we'll start with first deflagration and detonation and then talk about uh, premix flame. And only Wednesday we will talk about much more interesting things which involve uh, uh, multi-dimensional flames, effect of stretch, uh, effect of differential diffusion, and uh, alike. Thank you.